abdominal aorta. If you do not feel the pulse of the abdominal aorta, move your closed fist slightly to the right or left until you locate it. Then push your closed fist further down, compressing the abdominal aorta between the fist and the anterior wall of the vertebral column. If the compression is successful, the right hand will feel the femoral artery pulse disappear. Once the femoral pulse is gone, it means blood is no longer being delivered to the lower parts of the body, including the uterus. This will result in reduced blood loss. If your hands become tired, it is simple to switch the hands by moving to the other side of the patient. After confirming that the compression was successful, continue to apply pressure in the same location and make sure to constantly monitor the femoral pulse. There is nothing dangerous about this technique. Since there is substantial collateral circulation in the pelvic area, there will be no risk of reducing blood flow to other pelvic organs while continuing abdominal aorta compression for hours, even during transport to an emergency obstetric care center if need be. For this technique, it is important to keep in mind that the compression of the abdominal aorta in a postpartum patient is much easier than on a volunteer. This is because, one, since the woman has just delivered, the abdominal wall does not offer any muscular resistance to a compressing fist. Two, due to shock, the woman might even be semi-conscious or drowsy. And three, a woman who has just delivered and whose uterus is bleeding uncontrollably will be in hypovolemic shock and her arterial blood pressure in the aorta will be much lower than normal. This allows the compression of the abdominal aorta to be performed more easily. Let us now review the steps for this technique. 1. Localize and feel the pulsations of the femoral artery in the right groin. 2. Compress the aorta at the level of the umbilicus between a closed fist and the vertebral column. 3. Confirm the disappearance of the femoral pulse in the right groin. 4. Continue to apply pressure and continue to monitor the femoral artery. Always keep in mind that the compression has not solved any other problems related to or causing postpartum hemorrhage. It has only reduced blood loss. In this film, we will firstly explain how to reduce the need for manual removal of placenta and then, if these precautions fail, how to safely perform the manual removal of a placenta. Anemia or weak blood happens if women do not... Medical Aid Films has previously produced a training film which explains what you can do to prevent, recognise and treat postpartum haemorrhage. You are advised to watch that film before this one. Manual removal of the placenta is a procedure that is performed when a woman has a retained placenta. A retained placenta is when the woman does not spontaneously deliver her placenta within 30 minutes of a vaginal delivery. If she is stable and not bleeding heavily, the midwife can wait up to one hour before attempting manual removal of placenta. If she is bleeding heavily after the birth, and the placenta is not out, manual removal of placenta should be performed immediately. When the placenta is retained, it means the uterus cannot contract down and can lead to a postpartum hemorrhage, a serious and potentially life-threatening complication. We now understand that a placenta should be delivered spontaneously within 30 minutes of delivery and that complications can occur if this does not happen. Now it's time to find out how to help the woman deliver the placenta. During labour and in the 30 minutes after delivery, you should encourage the woman to empty her own bladder to assist the spontaneous delivery of the placenta. Yeah. 
A catheter should only be used if the woman is unable to pass urine herself. You should then try to get the woman to spontaneously deliver the placenta. If you pull on the cord, you must remember to protect the fundus to help prevent uterine inversion. If you pull too hard, the cord will tear away from the placenta. If the cord has already been pulled off, the placenta can still deliver spontaneously and so manual removal of placenta should not be performed until one hour after the delivery of the baby unless the woman is bleeding heavily. So if there is increased blood loss or concern about the woman's condition, then the attempts to deliver spontaneously have failed and you will need to perform a manual removal of placenta. You should be aware that there is a risk of hemorrhage, sepsis, and all the rare uterine perforation and uterine inversion associated with manual removal of placenta. By following these steps, you can help to reduce the risks and lead to better outcomes for women and their babies. Now it's time to go over to our health professional to find out more. Manual removal placenta should be done in a facility prepared to treat hemorrhage and to give intravenous infusion or medication. If the woman is not bleeding, then you might have time to transfer her to a better equipped facility. To reduce the risk of shock, you should ensure you are prepared to manage increased blood loss and hemorrhage. An IV line should be in a place as necessary precaution in case fluids, blood or IV drugs are needed to treat shock as a result of blood loss. Especially as the actual procedure might also be accompanied by a further hemorrhage. Remember the woman and the people supporting her may be frightened or distressed and so you should provide emotional support, explanation and encouragement. This procedure is painful and so, before beginning, advise the woman that analgesia or general anaesthetic will be necessary for pain relief. Make sure you manage the pain adequately. Preferably, you should either give spinal anaesthesia. If this is available to you, and if it can be administered quickly and safely, or IV catamine slowly as a dose of one milligram to two milligrams per kilogram, which in adult patient is 50 to 100 milligrams. You must also manage the risk of infection and sepsis, which are associated with this procedure. You do this by ensuring that infection precautions are adhered to and giving prophylactic intravenous antibiotics, starting at the same time as inducing density here. Give a single IV dose of antibiotics before starting the procedure using either ampicillin 2 grams IV plus metronidazole 500 milligrams IV or use cavasolid 1 gram IV plus metronidazole 500 milligrams IV if the former is not available. The infection risk associated with retained placenta is high even after the placenta is removed so you should give a 5-day course of prophylactic and oral antibiotics and bacillin 500 milligrams three times a day and metronidazole 400 milligrams three times a day thereafter. If there is already clinical evidence of infection, such as abdominal pain, offensive lochia, which means a bad smell from the vagina, increased temperature, or in some cases, rigors, then sepsis is likely. Sepsis can be life-threatening, so depending on what drugs are available, it starts with one dose of IV gentamicin, 160 milligrams stat plus ampicillin, one gram, three times a day, IV or oral, and metronidazole, 400 milligrams, three times a day, IV or oral. 
or use fluoxacillin one gram four times a day, IV or oral, preferably IV, for the first 48 hours and then orally for a further three days. Oral kindomycin 450 milligrams four times a day is preferable to ampicillin and fluoxacillin if it's available. The woman is now ready for the procedure and the health workers need to prepare themselves. Both procedure infection can be life-threatening and so the need for sterility and the use of aseptic techniques is very important. The health professionals hands and forearms need to be carefully washed and the woman's falfa should be cleansed and draped. Before beginning the manual removal of placenta procedure, please make one last check to determine that the placenta has not moved down into the vagina and can be simply removed without manual removal of placenta. After anesthetizing, cleansing and shaking the woman, you are now ready to begin the procedure. If the umbilical cord is still attached, then hold it with one hand and pull the cord gently until it's taut and parallel with the floor. Wearing high-level disinfected or sterilized gloves, use long gloves if available. Insert the other hand into the vagina and up into the uterus. If the cervix has closed down, then gentle continuous pressure must be applied to the cervix with the fingers of your cupped hand until it responds and dilates. Follow the cord to reach the placenta unless the cord is already detached prior to the procedure. In this case, insert your hand gently up into the uterus and feel for the edge of the placenta. Having located the placenta, let go of the cord and move that hand up over the abdomen to the fundus of the uterus to provide pressure to bring the fundus down onto the hand inside the uterus. Detach the placenta from the implantation site by keeping the fingers tightly together and using the edge of the hand to gently and gradually make a space between the placenta and the uterine wall, leafing it off. Do not open your fingers wide and claw at the placenta all the wall of the uterus. Proceed slowly all around the placenta bed until the whole placenta is detached from the uterine wall. Try to only bring your hands out of the uterus when the placenta has been freed and is now in your hands. Bringing your hand out and reinserting it greatly increases the risk of introducing infection. If the placenta does not separate from the uterine surface, by gentle lateral movement of the fingertips at the line of the cleavage, remove placental fragments. If the tissue is very adherent, suspect placenta agrita and refer the woman for consideration for laparotomy and possible subtotal hysterectomy. Once the placenta is freed and ready to be removed, hold on to it and slowly withdraw the hand from the uterus, bringing the placenta with it. At the same time, apply counter pressure superbubically with the other hand. If the placenta has not separated, this will prevent the uterus inverting or turning inside out. Explore the inside of the uterine cavity carefully to ensure that all placenta tissue has been removed. Give centosinone 10 units in 500 milliliters or 20 units in one liter of Ringer's lactate or normal saline and run at 60 drops per minute. The placenta has now safely been removed. Ask an assistant to massage the fundus of the uterus to encourage a uterine contraction. If there is a continued heavy bleeding used by manual compression and give misoprostol 800 micrograms rectally. Or consider intrauterine tamponade using a balloon catheter as for spartum hemorrhage protocol. If the placenta appears intact, you must still carefully examine to ensure that it's complete.
It should either be laid on a flat surface while it's examined, looking especially around the edges, or better still, place it over the back of your cupped hands and examine it carefully. Obviously, this cannot be done if the placenta has been removed piecemeal. If any placenta lobe or tissue is missing, explore the uterine cavity to remove it. If the placenta has been removed piecemeal, it will not be possible to identify missing cotyledons in this way. As with any delivery, ensure you check the woman repair any tears to the cervix or vagina or repair a vasectomy to ensure that all possible sources of bleeding have been identified and managed. Now that the procedure is complete and you are sure you have completely removed the placenta, you should make sure you wash and dry your own hands and arms carefully. Monitoring the patient and post-procedure care is important. Here is what you need to do. Take care to observe the woman closely until the effect of anesthesia or sedation has worn off. Monitor her vital signs, pulse, blood pressure, respiration and temperature, all of which can indicate a sign of infection. Ensure that you record details of the procedure you have carried out in the woman's record. Palpate the uterine fundus to ensure it remains contracted every 15 minutes for the first hour and then every 30 minutes for the next four hours or until stable. Watch for any abnormal bleeding. Even if the placenta appears intact, continue infusion of IV fluids until the woman is conscious and able to drink or longer while there's any suspicion of likely further bleeding. If the woman has been in shock, or lost more than two liters of blood, then transfuse as necessary. This should be done sooner if she was anemic to begin with. For example, if she had hemoglobin less than five grams. You should explain to the woman that her placenta did not deliver spontaneously and you had to manually remove her placenta. This means there's an increased chance she will have the same complication after her next birth. So you need to recommend that she gives birth to the centre equipped to deal with manual removal of the centre and that she informs the staff of her previous complications. So now you've seen how to manage a retained placenta and how to perform a manual removal of the placenta. This information will help you to save a woman's life. We hope you've enjoyed watching. There is no greater joy than the birth of a child, and no greater tragedy than the death of a mother during childbirth. As often as 1,000 times a day, a mother dies giving birth. The leading direct cause of maternal mortality is hemorrhage. Women rapidly go into shock from hemorrhage, but they die from delays. Delays in finding transport, delays during transport, and delays waiting for definitive care in referral facilities. What can save these mothers is a low-cost, reusable, easy-to-apply first aid device, the NASG, a non-pneumatic anti-shock garment made of neoprene and Velcro. By compression, the NASG stops bleeding and keeps blood in the vital organs during shock. 
The Safe Motherhood program at the University of California, San Francisco has demonstrated that the NASG buys time that helps mothers survive delays. The NASG is a lightweight compression suit made of neoprene and Velcro with six segments that close around the ankle, calf, thigh, pelvis, and abdomen. The Velcro fastenings keep the garment on tightly. The abdominal segment, number five, contains a small foam ball to apply pressure to the uterus. Anyone can be trained to apply the NASG. First, place the NASG under the woman. The top of the NASG should be at the level of her lowest rib, and the row of yellow dots should be along her spine. Starting at the ankles, close segment number one tightly around each ankle and hear a sharp sound. Next, close segment number two. Try to leave the woman's knee free and bend it. Are you okay, my Apply segment number three, the thigh segment, in the same way as one and two. Apply segment number four, the pelvic segment, all around the woman at the level of the pubic bone. Place segment number five, with the pressure ball, directly over the umbilicus. Then close the NASG with segment number six. Although two people can more rapidly close the leg segments, only one person should close the pelvic and abdominal segments, four, five, and six, to avoid applying too much pressure. All segments should be applied using as much strength as possible. However, do not close the abdominal muscle so tight that it restricts the woman's breathing. If the source of bleeding appears to be uterine acne, administer hypotonic drugs and massage the uterus. NASG is allowing room for your hand. <laughs> For demonstration purposes, we are applying it to a fully clothed model who weighs 227 pounds, 103 kilograms. <laughs> 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 Yes, go. good morning. I'm uh, Dr. Bameka Agri, and uh, I'll be the chairperson for this meeting. 
uh, as you may realize, this is the regional dissemination of obstetric hemorrhage implementation framework and postpartum hemorrhage guidelines. So it is for the Eastern region, stretching from uh, Jinja to Umbali and then uh, up to Vosia. So we shall start with a, a prayer, then we shall have soft introductions, and then the other things will follow, will follow as per the uh, schedule. So can we have a prayer from a volunteer? Sister Liz. Spirit, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this gathering. We thank you for the noble cause as to why we are here. We pray that you guide us throughout the session, that whatever we are going to achieve from here is for the benefit of ourselves and the clients that we attend to. We pray that you give us a conducive weather we pray all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Liz, for that prayer. Now we move on to soft introductions. Maybe I will start. I'm Dr. Bameka Agre, an obstetrician and gynecologist. I'm uh, Emugole, graduated just a few days, a few days ago. Mm. Then uh, I can move on. Thank you so much, Chair. My name is Nakatube Hadija, midwife and uh, member of National Midwives Association of Uganda. Thank you. I'm Nam Sabia Margaret, a midwife from Budono Health Center. Oh, uh, good morning. I'm Nabankema Elizabeth. You can call me Liz, midwife, Bwenge Center for. Yes, good morning. I'm Dr. Wanyara Peter. I'm on Abu Sandagani from Mumbale region. I just graduated the other day with Dr. Bameka on Monday. Thank you. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm by name is of Msito Silva. I work with Augo. I'm in the transport sector. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues, for the introductions. I think without losing time, we shall be going on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, that should be remarks from the from the Assistant Commissioner in charge of Reproductive and Infant Health, Dr. Mugahi Richard. I don't know if he has already logged in. If not, we, pardon? Isn't on yet. So I think we shall have to move on to the, the next presentation as we keep tracking when the Commissioner comes on. So that will be a presentation on the burden of postpartum hemorrhage in Uganda. And I'll present that. Thank you. Have uh, members. Uh, maybe I can introduce them. We have Doctor uh, Doctor Mulindwa, Alex, 
we have Dr. Senyonga Suzet, Dr. Ulbafos Musoga, we have Wonabana, uh, we have Geoffrey Vataringaya, we have Joel Loasa, is my colleague, we have uh, Dr. Katokenet, we have Namu Ganyistela, we have Namu Savi, Oliver, Namu Asejoan, uh, Robert Isavirie, Then the others, I think, will be saying hello as they log in. Doctor? Hey, Dr. Nonge Sam, sorry. Uh, how can I forget my teacher? Dr. Nonge Sam. Uh, other members, please feel free to say hello as you join in. But meanwhile, we can move on to the next item on the agenda. And that is a presentation of the burden of postpartum hemorrhage in Uganda. So once again, The NASG may not save the life of every mother dying in childbirth, but the initial field data gathered over 10 years. Bear with us, we are sharing the screen. Is that fine? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, once again, I'm uh, Dr. Bameka Agri, an obstetrician working with the Jinja District Local Government at Wenge General Hospital. Yes, so, so this is an overview of postpartum hemorrhage in Uganda, looking at the burden of PPH in our country. So post postpartum hemorrhage is preventable. And it is the leading cause of maternal mortality in both rich and uh, poor countries. And every woman is at risk. And those that survive actually suffer severe morbidity, suffer severe morbidity. And what makes it hard is that the actual burden is grossly underestimated because the, feas the feasibility of accurate measurement in routine care is difficult. We know that usually when a mother's uh, delivered, you have uh, uh, liqua mi mixed with blood. So it makes the objective assessment really hard of blood loss. So the existing measurement, measurement options have inaccuracies because of this combination of fluid that uh, are always uh, mixed together. And the data on PPH is not routinely captured. If you look at, in many of our records, somehow people uh, miss out on it or grossly underestimate. You find the every delivery done, estimated blood loss is 300 to 400. I don't know who came up with that average. That actually seems to be on the lower end, on the lower side of the continent. Uh, and we can look at how big is this problem. Globally, postpartum hemorrhage uh, ranges about five to twenty-five percent, and the prevalence per hundred women, those that, they, that those that lose uh, five hundred mils or more, is about twenty-five point seven percent. And those that, severe, that suffer severe PPH, losing more than a thousand mils, 
is about 5.1%. PPH is the leading cause of maternal death worldwide, and uh, it is responsible for about 25% of deliver associated deaths and 8% for maternal deaths in developed countries. The case fatality rate in one of the, the trials was 3% in Africa and 1.7% in Asia. Being referred from a facility due to PPH increases the, leg, uh, the, chances, the chances of death by almost three times. And uh, that is terrible. We understand in most of our centers, someone is referred from a center three, goes bleeding to a center four, also finds no blood products to then uh, refer to a district hospital, regional referral. Quite often by the time you, someone reaches the point of care where otherwise they will receive service, they are almost a Ah, uh, So between, uh, 12% of the pregnant women experience PPH after childbirth, okay, around there. And one in three women have anemia in pregnancy. This is our biggest challenge, is that our, most of our women already come when they have some degree of anemia. And even during antenatal, few facilities, as we shall see, only a few facilities are doing first, uh, uh, first trimester uh, hemoglobin assessment. Therefore, it is hard to uh, uh, judge, to determine the degree of uh, anemia that someone will present with early enough so that you can correct during the course of antenatal. So the risk of PPH when anemic goes up to 50%. Of course, someone will bleed a little and then they flip over to the other side. PPH case fatality then goes to 2% goes to 2.3% to for those women that are now already, already have a degree of anemia during pregnancy. PPH is responsible for 34% of all maternal deaths that are reviewed in Uganda. So if you look at uh, the reviews, currently uh, Minister of Health is, has put a lot of effort, effort in uh, MPDSR, but most of the reviews that we are doing, 34% of the deaths due to postpartum hemorrhage. So we can look at the five leading causes of this in Uganda as per age groups. You can look at the contribution of uh, hemorrhage being highest at women, uh, among women that are uh, okay, above 25, but also those with missing age. This is the, as a, a uh, a result of data incompleteness. But 42% of the facility maternal deaths are, obstetric, are due to obstetric hemorrhage. PPH accounts for about 80% of this hemorrhage and then uh, antepartum hemorrhage about 20%. 15% of the deaths are due to hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and 10% sepsis. Let me not forget to state that uh, uh, this month of May is uh, uh, preeclampsia, awareness month so and uh, it is also coming up actually in some facilities you find preeclampsia accounting for more deaths than even pph so it's also something to look at and then you can look at also the six leading causes of maternal deaths by health facility level now here you will see that almost at every facility except for for the clinics uh, Hemorrhage is the commonest cause. Hemorrhage was the leading cause of deaths across all levels of health care, with the biggest contribution at the health facilities two and three levels. And at four and above, the maternal deaths were due to multiple causes. Of course, levels two and three, we don't have uh, blood transfusion services, therefore it is, uh, I think it could be the reason why whoever goes there and has some complications of bleeding, they almost get uh, poor outcomes. And also we can look at the trends that are reported on the PPH cases. Uh, the national case fatality rate is around 2.4. And the region with the highest being Kampala, of course we know Kampala and it, uh, the challenges there, about 5.8%. 
and then uh, the lowest the region with the lowest being Karamoja and Tororo and Toro region. But generally, most regions reported an increase in the case fatality rates over the period of time. That's comparing 2020 and 2021. I don't know whether the COVID uh, pandemic could also could have contributed. So maternal mortality trends also, we can compare between 2020 and 2021. And you see, as above, the month of April to June tends to always have the highest numbers of deaths. Maybe we need to look at why that. And then if you look at the different regions, Kampali again is up there because you have, Kampala tends to have the good and the bad. And given the high population, then you are at risk of having the bad outcomes more there. Anemia in pregnancy in our setting, you find again, if you compare 2020 and 2021, you find that at first antenatal visit, again, between January and March in 2020, we had 9.8% uh, of the women having some degree of anemia. And then again, April and June, still it was up. Maybe we need to investigate why, why April and June. Then still Kampala. But don't forget that this is only those few women that are having their uh, HB estimation done. But quite often, this is not uh, routinely done, given the different reasons at the different facilities. Then the percentage of women who, who are tested for anemia using HB at first and tenth of East, you see what we are talking about. Uh, much has it improved to uh, from 11.1% to above 20s, but still 23% is low. If you look at our ANC attendance, that the number is still low. So we need to look at ways of uh, pulling up this. At least I'm happy now that ministry is supplying uh, CBC machines to the center force. Maybe it will also improve. And also we have remote at center threes. I think this will help us in improving this indicator. So to Toro region again, Toro, Bukedi, and Karamoja had the lowest. The highest were Toro, Bukedi, and Karamoja. Well, lowest was Teso region. So uh, Teso, maybe we need to see how to improve again, like the whole country is doing badly when it comes to testing for HP. Efforts are in place to deliver some testing equipment under NMS, that sounds good to hear. And I can also attest to that, I've, we've received some equipment. So percentage of women tested for anemia in first continental, again, we continue. Uh, Bukedi region and the Toro, they are doing uh, much better than most of the other regions. Uh, Bunyoro, Lango, and Teso being on the other lower end. More data is there, uh, quantifying the degree of anemia in a pregnancy as per region. If someone wants to study their regions, we shall share this data, and it is over the means of health uh, uh, data so, uh, uh, in, the, in the data sources. So for cesarean section, this is something that is coming up. We see that the number of cesarean sections, cesarean deliveries being done are going up. So does this reduce PP, uh, the chances of developing PPH, PPH and morbidity associated? So looking at this, PPH mortality, you, Uganda prevalence uh, Uganda prevalence of cesarean section is at 12% currently. But uh, maternal mortality after the intersection was 50 to 100 times in low, low and middle income countries than in other developed countries. So probably our sisters also are not that safe. Uganda 54, in Uganda, 54% of the MDs were after cesarean delivery. This is worrying. And uh, recently we had a discussion in one of the audits 
whereby doctors could see the mothers and they never come back to review. It was a major issue that is being followed up in most of the center force. Doctors do the work of doing the cesarean sessions, but they leave it to the nurses and midwives to do the post-op care. And almost whoever developed complications either died or suffered severe morbidity. So colleagues, we have a role to play here. 67% of the maternal deaths were attributed to PPH. Again, I'm happy that the Assistant Commissioner, Dr. Mugahe, as one of our targets this year is to have all the center for all the small facilities to have blood transfusion services. However, in Ginger, we've not yet succeeded in this, but a lot of effort is being uh, is being put in, and I think by the end of the year, probably many of our centers in Ginger will be having transfusion services. So blood and body products is at the center of our discussion today, if we are to save mothers, but don't for, let's not forget that it all starts with the prevention of anemia, uh, before pregnancy, during pregnancy, it's management if it is detected, and then subsequently we can have reduced morbidity and mortality due to postpartum hemorrhage. So looking at cumulative numbers of days of blood products, blood stock out of blood products, this is alarming. Look at the region. Uh, stock out in 2020, number of days for which they had no blood or bloody products. It's over a thousand days. And when you look at South Central in 2021, over 3,000 days, they had no blood or bloody products. So what was happening to mothers that were delivering or suffering uh, with complications of uh, PPH during this period? It is terrible. Karamoja is even, Karamoja again was doing fairly well. I don't know why Karamoja. Is it reduced? I don't know. I don't want to. But uh, really, it is alarming. We are doing badly when it comes to the stockouts of blood, of blood and bloody products. Again, a continuation. If you look at government health center for stockouts over one, over 14,000 days. Actually, in 2020, it was 15,994 days of stock out. But uh, as I, I already mentioned, the center force, many of our center force are not having these uh, blood transfusion services. So it is good that Minister took it up. Uh, challenges in management of PPH. One, delays in detection of PPH. People tend to take long to make the decision and accept the, the diagnosis that we are having, PPH, primary PPH. And this delays treatment. Someone who keeps, there is a, there is a, a perineal acceleration, they keep swabbing and swabbing and trying to mop and they then they stitch and stitch. And someone is continuing to bleed. And they are not, because when the diagnosis is made, then the protocol will be instituted. So this delays treatment and uh, we need a lot of training for most of our, our colleagues. Lack of essential equipment, supplies and medicines. This has been happening at one point, even oxytocin was out of stock for so long, then come to IV fluids. But uh, this we need to actively engage there uh, members of uh, any maternity to, we need to use our data when planning for our supplies for maternity, for labor. This, this is the challenge I found that someone who goes to plan is not using their data. They just keep putting what was used for the, the previous financial year. They just keep saying yes instead of using your data to see what has changed. So what do we need more? What can we maybe have quantities reduced? So that will help us in this. BP machines are almost always absent. 
When we buy them, the sales run out. When you buy rechargeable batteries, they keep disappearing. I don't know who takes them, but uh, at first level, we can discuss those ones. Syringes. Again, this I, I think it is really about using our data to plan for uh, supplies. Blood shortages, this is obvious. Um, lack of skills to implement recommended guidelines, this is also true. But it is good we're having this uh, training at regional levels. But I think also we shall need, as ministry and implementing partners, we shall need uh, probably more, maybe facility-based uh, trainings for, for most of the, in most of the regions, I think we shall need facility based trainings on top of what we are doing. Lack of infra inf infrastructure to support interventions like electricity, uh, refrigeration temperatures. Yes, this is also happening in uh, some of the facilities. Though the solar projects have come up, we are, we are now having solar refrigerators that have just been installed. They will reduce on some of these. Many health providers do not follow guidelines. This is another problem. What someone learned in, in uh, 20, 20, 2002 wants to keep practicing the same. They don't want to change. They want, but uh, gradually we should keep uh, training our colleagues. I think sometimes people are hesitant to learn new things, but uh, with the persistent pressure and support, they tend to, to pull up. Then the guidelines are not updated. This is very true. Many of our labor suits have all the guidelines. So we need to always uh, do all with the old ones and uh, come with, uh, replace with the new guidelines. As I conclude, the burden is high and the PPH is grossly underestimated. The impact on maternal outcomes is very high and we must act now. Thank you for listening. Uh, maybe some clarifications or questions we can entertain. Uh, I'll be co-hosting with, uh, with Thank you so much, Dr. Agre, for that presentation. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Agri, for that presentation. Very elaborate presentation. I'm just wondering whether we have any questions from the audience, and then we can take questions from the online participants. So we have no questions here. Uh, we can check whether there are any questions from the online participants. So our, um, as we're waiting for questions, we have, um, there is a question here, but Dr. Mga has said that he has been called by the PS, so he will be joining us later, uh, even Dr. Nonge. So let's give chance to the online people. Mm. Dr. Nonge, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Uh... Thank you, Khadija, and thank you, Dr. Bameka. I, I didn't want actually to ask a question, but I just wanted to echo the same message from Commissioner. I, he had logged on, but he got a, a call from the PS, so he had actually to jump out. But I want to, to thank the Eastern region, that is Jinja and Mbali, Organizing this, and uh, thank you, Bameka and Tamusava, and also to thank uh, Awogu for spearheading this dissemination. And we want to appreciate all the people who have actually made this happen. But also to to thank the the people who are in Mbale 
in Bali region OE for the launch of the guidelines which we are disseminating today. That it is, it is one of the things we say it's a landmark this year for us to have those guidelines. We were supposed to come with some hard copies to Ginger. Unfortunately, we were not able to get them by yesterday. But uh, the soft copies are available, but you'll also get the hard copies to people who are on the ground. I will maybe end there and then I will add in my submission a bit later. Over to you, Adija. Thank you so much, Dr. Sam Wanonge. By the way, Dr. Sam Wanonge is the head of the PPH, NASMEC PPH subcommittee, and he's our chair. We thank you so much for the work and your guidance that you always give us. Any other? Yes, there is um, a question from Joan. Joan, go ahead and, and ask your question. Over to you, John. Amazing this, and thank you so much, Dr. Ameka. Uh, my concern is about the, the guidelines. We may always want to have the guidelines at lower centers, but we fail to identify where to get these guidelines. And now they are like the major issue is practicing the old practice. It is what we know, it's what we have, it's what we are practicing. How are we going to be getting these new guidelines? Like now we are launching that or you are disseminating the one of PPH at our own levels down here. How are we going to be getting those guidelines? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joan. That is a pertinent question you have raised. It is actually what I've just mentioned that uh, I've just had the, the launch of the guidelines uh, this last week and the there are some copies which are being printed now there's a committee in charge of ensuring that we get enough guidelines for all the health facilities apart from the the, the guidelines that the air force size they are also uh, planning to to print out the pocket size guidelines and the, the forecast for that is that every health worker should at least have a pocket size. Uh, because if you produce few, they will disappear in uh, some hands and the, uh, Mr. Bosco will not have a chance to have a look at it. So there is a, currently what we're doing now is try to go regional. And then from the regions, we go to the district, and the district should be able to access every health facility. Those so, Joan, just be patient. Yeah. Meanwhile, we can share the soft copies, yeah, and that should be good enough for us to begin with. <laughs> I don't know whether that is good enough, Joan. No, no. I, I will pass on the information. It's like she got off along the way, but I will pass on the information to the Ginger team. Yes, Dr. Nakendo. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bameka, for the nice presentation on your burden of postpartum hemorrhage in Uganda. My name is uh, Dr. Nakendo Abubakar. I am uh, an obstetrician and gynecologist working in Bujiri Hospital, Bujiri General Hospital. Um, just a comment. If you are to discuss the issue of burden of postpartum hemorrhage in Uganda, I mean, people, mothers dying due to postpartum hemorrhage, there are things we really need to look at, like you have, you have emphasized in your presentation. One of the things, um, the Uganda Blood Transfusion Services, I think they should do help us, especially for us clinicians in uh, our hospitals up country, to make sure that uh, 
the blood products. Blood and blood products are available in hospital. Um, Dr. Ameka and every gynecologist who is here, I've seen Dr. from Mbale. You are, we, are to, we are caught in, we are caught, uh, our hands are tied when you are having this mother's bleeding. And one of the main intervention is she should have blood. But when you have no blood in your facility. So blood transfusion services should make our life you know, simpler, provide this blood, make the awareness of the community to donate blood. Then also, the other thing as clinicians, I think it's important we emphasize the point of early recognition and timely intervention. This is very, very important. You're having a mother, you should get the history of antenatal, um, history of the previous pregnancies, previous deliveries. This mother has been having PPH. Be on the lookout. Early recognition, timely intervention. The moment you suspect that you have in PPH. Don't take long to intervene. If you take long to intervene, you find there are things you would have done to save this mother. But because when you take long to intervene, you always caught, you know, in that situation of, you know, somebody dying. So that's my submission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. We have a hand here. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Bameka, for the presentation where we have seen the burden of PPH in Uganda is a little big. But uh, remember, we have some other institutions that would, uh, that I feel they're supposed to know about probably the new guidelines. Uh, and those are the training institutions. How are you going to help the teachers in the training institutions get the updates of PPH and the guidelines? Because it is the teachers who are teaching the midwives to go out and work. And yet you said that some people have the, the old knowledge of some time back, and I believe that is what we are still giving the students who are coming to help the mothers. So how are we going to help the training institutions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vameka, for the good presentation. My concern is among the challenges of management of PPH, like the lack of skills to implement recommended guidelines. Eh? Like in the lower facilities, A number of colleagues that have joined, uh, Sister Sandra Mogeza, Dr. Ankalubo, Dr. Joko Jennifer, uh, uh, Dr. Musaba Milton, congratulations up, upon your recent achievement, Dr. Asen, and uh, Dr. Esther Virongi. I forgot the name. Uh, so to, to try and answer, how are we going to help the training institutions? This is a big thing, really. Teachers need, need to be part of these, uh, these uh, uh, guidelines. They need to be, always be part of, uh, 
the trainings, we need to give them the new knowledge. In case of anything, we should always involve them. So personally, I think, actually, it is the reason you're here. <laughs> the reason you're here. So people in training institutions need to be considered whenever we have these disseminations. And also, we need to encourage them to be part of the professional bodies, because this is where you easily get this knowledge. You know, it is hard, training institutions are so many, but if you're part of the association of obstetricians, you're part of the association of physicians and what, then you get the information. This should be upon the teachers to do it. And as administrators at some of the schools, should be part of your appraisals for them. Someone should be attached to some, some of the professional bodies. Uh, comparing the trainings, because Sister Namus was saying, why don't we, do it the HIV way, that HIV people are always up and down, mentoring people, even at lower facilities. It also got me thinking that in 2019, we had the two guidelines of the HIV protocol, they were reviewed twice. For maternal and newborn care, it has taken us more than five days to have one review, which even took almost two years to be finally uh, signed off. So, but it is good that Minister has now taken it up. I think things will become better. As I talk now, our target is to ensure that all, all SEMOC facilities have blood transfusion services. This is a good statement. And uh, it shows the, that Ministry is now taking the right direction in, uh, when it comes to maternal and child uh, health. Probably it will also join, will be as active as the HIV team. Uh, but uh, allow me let one person introduce himself. But, uh... Sorry, can you introduce yourself? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julius Wandawa. I'm the dean of the Faculty of Science. I'm a gynecologist by training. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so, any other questions? Dr. Nonge has something. Uh, Dr. Nonge, please feel free to unmute and uh, submit. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bameka. And I want to appre appreciate my teacher, my mentor, Dr. Julius Wandava, for joining the team in, in Ginger. Thank you, thank you so much. And I, I do honor you for, for so many things. I will stop there. I would just like to respond to, to comments from Nakendo. Uh, those are very, very pertinent comments. The blood transfusion services have really tried their part, especially from last year, to ensure that we access blood despite the challenges from uh, which were happening across the country. Now, for us to have adequate amount of blood, it ranges from one donation, mobilization of donors, to have this blood screened, to have this blood uh, stored, and then to have this blood uh, distributed to, to various regions. And lastly, the correct use of blood. So we have a responsibility as, a, as partners, we as OBG1, I know you being there, you're a champion. We need to see how do you make this function? From mobilizing donors, if you went, uh, Dr. Nakendo, to a radio station that there is a blood donation drive, and you added your voice that we need blood, we have lost a, a mother two or three because of lack of blood. I believe there will be so many people who will join in to come and donate blood because that's usually a challenge. We rely on schools as voluntary donors. There is usually the communities find it very difficult, but your voice and many others who are here would make things actually much, much, much better. Meanwhile, the minister does the screening and then the distribution. But the other role for us as clinicians is the rational use of blood and accountability. Uh, most often you find that blood, we don't know where blood goes. And I'm, I'm not shy to say some of our region have been labeled badly on where blood goes, either blood 
disappears from the distribution place uh, to the private places. But if it's accounted and we know the woman has benefited out of it, that is okay. That is also a key thing which I believe uh, Uganda Blood Transfusion Service is enforcing soon so that every unit is accounted for and no blood basically expires. And we need to learn how to redistribute. If you know that I have excess of this blood group, can I call Mbali and ask them if they're in their need of that group so that we don't basically lose that? The other comment maybe is on training institutions. Yes, um, I'm glad some of the people who are in attendance are from training institutions and they should be able to run with these guidelines because if a pre-service is taken care of, the people who are coming out, we shall have less uh, challenges of mentoring them. I agree with you uh, that even the training institutions should be taken care of. They should get the hard copies. They should be joining in the in the webinars, which are scheduled on uh, every monthly, and let your students also join because this is a learning experience. And we believe uh, these webinars, together with also uh, workshops like this, is now the new platform. Uh, Minister of Health is planning to have most of these things in, uploaded in their portal so that people can access freely without any difficulties. The other target is the other group apart from training institutions is the community, the cultural leaders, uh, plus the private sector. We don't need, most often you find somebody referred from private sector. We need to be also engaging them in this, I, and I hope Bameka, you have some people from private sector. Over to you, Bameka. When the commissioner comes in, we shall give him time so that he can give his opening remarks, and then we shall continue with the work. The, if somebody should be in the watch out of him logging in. Over. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Nonge. Uh, any other submissions? whether online or in the room. Yes, Dr. Kauva, Dr. Nakendo. Is Hello. Okay. Hello. Please, Hello, submit. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dr. Kauva Baka. I, I just have a few, like, comments. One, uh, I've just been going through actually looking at the our annual health sector performance report. And then it indicates that 46% uh, of our health facility deliveries are occurring at health center three. So I don't know uh, which, what do, we, what do we have in plan to make sure that at least the the cadres at that health at that level at least gotten on board for this, and then the second one is about to still we see that uh, the the, first, the health center for that are able to to offer CMNOC services. Uh, I think we are at around the fifty percent. That is as for 2020, 2021. And then it's very encouraging that the ministry is taking it on to make sure that at least all facilities can be able to offer. But I don't know how, how much we, are, we can be able to really push in line with that to get to like maybe 100%. Thank you. Well, I, how I wish Dr. Mugahi was also here to hear about the 46% of the deliveries. Uh, but uh, the fact that we're, we're pushing it down to center fours, I think uh, at least center fours are not very far from health center threes. Uh, and also that, that shows that soon we shall now uh, go down to center threes. But uh, this is really something up for discussion. If 46% of the deliveries are in center threes, then we need to actively take it up. I will forward it whenever I have chance. 
And also when you Dr. Mugahi, the com assistant commissioner, when he comes up, we shall have to re-echo this. Then uh, Center Force uh, offering same work, this has, is being taken up seriously. So I, I, I think actually very good things are happening to the extent that if you have a Center for that is not functioning as expected, offering the, the same uh, services, if you have a genuine reason as why you're not doing so, you can just directly forward it to Dr. Mugahi and you will be sorted in the shortest time possible. We've had a number of anesthetic officers being appointed within less than a month because you, you have someone has been in the facility, cesarean sessions are not being done because there is no anesthetic officer, but someone has been trained. And these people have been, they have been appointed with the guidance from the ministry. So for those of us that are in health center force, if you have any issues that are hindering your service delivery, please bring them up. We even have a forum for fun, uh, functionalizing health center falls, and it is very active and a lot of wonders are happening. Mm. Dr. Chizala Susan Yokam, she's my, she's our chairperson for AOGU Eastern region. Uh, so, if there are no other questions, I think we can move on to the next presentation. That is uh, by Dr. Sam Onongi on the obstetric hemorrhage implementation in framework. Dr. Onongi, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Bameka. Maybe as they load my presentation, I just wanted to comment on maybe just give a feedback to Abu Bakar who talked about health performance framework, annual health sector performance. Yes, indeed, we are having so many deliveries at health center threes. And uh, the aim is, is that these people should be actually mentored and equipped, facilitated to carry out the basics, emergency obstetric care as per the structure of Ministry of Health. I hope the team is loading my presentation. And as I answer. Uh, yes, doctor, we are working on it. Okay. So in essence, we are not leaving them out. Uh, we hope that the people present here in your supervision and mentorship should be able to actually reach them. And the, the other is health center falls 50% functional is a drive which has been taken by ministry. And I'm praying that you people from that region try to uh, point out, advocate for functionalization of all health center falls. Usually you find from the Thursday meeting which happens every week you getting reports, health center this is now has, is operating. They have good blood, they have got a fridge. It depends on how active you people in Eastern region, because other regions are, are like in Arua who are informed, this is only two uh, health facilities which do not have a fully functional CMOC abilities. And I don't know, maybe it's, Awogu and the people from Eastern region, you need to take stock of your region and see what are the facilities which are not functioning and what is the reason. And forward it to the commissioner. Commissioner's office is approachable. Air it out and should be able to use that as a platform for advocacy. You see, I think Mayuge, Mayuge in Eastern region, they got an anesthetist just because of that advocacy. So we need also to use that opportunity. So Abu Bakr, if you know in health center four, which is not functional, give the reason and forward it to the relevant authorities and see how we can be able to work on that. So uh, thank you, thank you. I'm going to take you through this obstetric hemorrhage activity implementation framework. As Dr. Bameka has presented earlier this morning, PPH still remains the, the leading cause of maternal mortality, contributing to about 35% of all the deaths which are reviewed across the country. And this trend is not coming down. 
And what I'm going to take you through is the, the work of Ministry of Health plus the academia and implementing partners where they saw why it is happening. Should we have something for us to target or to use and benchmark our activities as regards reduction of, uh, of maternal deaths due to excessive bleeding. So this is what I'm just going to take you through. The next slide. Now, just to backtrack a bit, just to remind ourselves, our current population for Uganda is about 43 million. And the women of the reproductive age take almost like about 23 million. And if you looked at that, on average, about 2.2 million uh, women get pregnant. A very, very active population. There are few who end up with uh, pregnancy losses, but you might end up with like about 1.9 million or 2 million women ending up with deliveries. And that is the responsibility of us, the clinicians, to take care of these women during pregnancy, during childbirth, and also in the postpartum period. Now, we are not doing very well as regards our maternal mortality ratio, which is at 336 per 100,000 live births. But we hope that uh, with all what the minister and what all of you as champions are doing, this figure is likely to come down. And with a planned survey, which is soon, that should be able to bring us somewhere and, and see which other areas we need to improve on. The burden has already been explained. I don't need to repeat the slide here, but just to emphasize that in all areas, PPH is, is still, is case fatality is very, very high. Compared to others, if we looked at uh, Uganda with the, 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 the data which we have, I think our case fatality due to PPH is about 2.3. That's the figures which we is not basically reported here. Next slide. Next slide. Now, this is the trend over the last three years of maternal mortality not coming down. And I want you to look at your region uh, of PPH in your region. My eyes are not seeing very well. Then where is ginger? Let me just try to widen. Apologies, I am trying to read. My eyes are getting all here. So we have Elegon, which is the Mbale region, where the figures in the in the last year it came down a bit to about twenty eight uh, percent uh, PPH contributing to maternal mortality from around forty eight, and we need to learn from ginger uh, from basically the the Mbale people how they manage to basically reduce that. Maybe Dr. Wandava and Musawa, uh, it is good to, that you are attending today's meeting. The, the Busoga region is slightly above the average. It is around 41. And since we are meeting together, we need to learn. I know in, in Mbali, they have a lot of preeclampsia. That's why we last week were there celebrating or oh, marking the preeclampsia day basically in Mbali. So this is how bad it is. So we want to, we're comparing regions so that we can target what can be done in specific area, but on close, combining the old average, this is at 39%. But if we added the last report of last year, the figure came to about 35%. This graph needs to be basically updated. Next. From the review of all the maternal death, which happens in different facilities, why are women continuing to die? 
one of the clear reason which is coming out repeatedly is delay in deciding to seek appropriate care by the woman herself or the family and you find in some of these cases that the men are not there on the ground there is lack of many involvement two is that people do not know what is the condition if somebody says little bleeding said no i will go tomorrow not knowing that any bleeding in in a pregnancy after childbirth can be what can be actually challenging and then the other one is the delay in reaching appropriate facility for emergency care you saw from the presentation which dr bameka mentioned referral is a challenge and if you are referred when you are being carried in a border border and you are bleeding that is really a very very big problem two is that uh, sometimes the, the 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 even the referral connecting from one facility to, to, to the other is difficult and you saw from the statistics which he presented that if you are a referred case and you get a ppa you are three times most likely to die because PPH takes a very, very short time to kill you. We usually say that if you have a PPH, it takes you like about two hours for you to lose all, all your blood. And if there is any delay in the transportation, that's how bad it is. So if we are able to manage this case from wherever it is, to prevent that PPH, then we could be able to prevent that maternal mortality. The other reason which keeps on coming is a delay in receiving the adequate care when at the facility, and this is related with the quality of drugs, especially for the prevention and treatment of obstetric hemorrhage. And here specifically, we are speaking on to the hydrotonics. And I'm glad today we, are, uh, we shall be talking on the use of heat stable carbetosin, which is a neutrotonic, which can sustain this quality without necessarily needing a, a, a cold chain. But there are other drugs like uh, misoprostol, uh, which some people have also questioned on their quality, especially some of the manufacturers have really poor, poor quality. The other reason within the facility is the commodities, uh, which people have just discussed here, blood and blood products. I don't need to repeat it. Uh, health worker skills for management of obstetric hemorrhage and then monitoring especially after delivery as clinicians were often called the woman you operated has changed condition and that is not good for you to hear when you are told that the woman you operated has changed condition most often is in poor state so you but that comes as a result that somebody has not paid attention. There was a woman who was operated two hours ago, no one has taken the blood pressure. And at the end of the day, the attendants are the ones who will call you that the woman is failing to sit up or she has collapsed in bed, just because we did not pay our attention. So these are some of the things few which I, I picked out there, there are many others. Lack of theater space, the contributing factors to what is the women die. Uh, so, after looking at all what was happening, the Minister of Health, together with the, academ the people in academia, and implementing partners said and says, okay, can we have an active implementation framework so that we can accelerate the reduction of maternal mortality, initially due to PPH, but they expanded it to obstetric hemorrhage. Because if you have a brachio, it also can lead you to having basically a PPH. And the goal of this activity framework is to accelerate implementation of high impact interventions for reducing maternal mortality due to obstetric hemorrhage. And we have this framework running from 2021 to 2025. 
And our target is, can we reduce maternal mortality to at least 210 and institutional maternal mortality to 20 per 100,000 deliveries within the facility. This is in line with the sharpened plan of Minister of Health. And hopefully we should be able to, when we implement what is listed in that uh, obstetricimary access plan, we should be able to try to reach that target, those targets. Next. So the purpose of this obstetric activity framework, one is to guide, first of all, the Minister of Health and all other stakeholders on the implementation of strategically prioritized interventions to address obstetric hemorrhage. And the other one is to use it as a, a way to track progress in implementing this active framework so that we know, like what we've just discussed earlier, people are saying how many CMOC facilities are functional, the, the annual performance sector performance report is saying at 50, we want to see it reaching 100% then you are able to congratulate ourselves and say, yes, we have achieved something. Blood transfusion, having refrigeration in this smoke facility, how many of them? 100%. That is the, the role of basically this tool. The framework has two components. It has the research framework, which has the overall goals, strategic objectives and intended results. But he has also the logical framework, which has the different activities. And I think how the activities can be made. Justin, Justin, Lucas, are you able to mute so that we can reduce on the echoes? Thank you. Thank you. So these are the two different components which I'm going to take you through. Next slide. Next slide. So this is the results framework, which has the, the goal and the four strategic objectives, uh, which speak into leadership, capacity building, the essential commodities, and how we can improve the health skin behaviors. And I'm going to touch uh, briefly on each one of them. The, the, the actual framework, if we were to go through it, it will take the whole day. And I'm hoping that the people who are physical in the meeting will get hard copies. And those online, please, I will share this with them such that we can people get to know what is contained in this uh, in this framework. So I'm going to take you straight to strategic objective number one in the next slide. Next slide. So this is the strategy objectives of uh, obstetric hemorrhage framework. Uh, one is to strengthen leadership, accountability, and the policy environment for the management of maternal and newborn health with a focus on obstetric hemorrhage. And you might say, but this is not my responsibility. All of us are leaders, and I'm glad that we have ministers of health leaders who are really supporting some of the ventures we're doing. But we also want to use opportunity for us to be accountable for whatever we're doing. If what we discussed, for example, the availability of heterotonics and blood, you should be accountable for any unit which comes to your facility. The other one is to strengthen the capacity of health workers to provide quality MNA services with focus on obstetric hemorrhage. That's strategic objective number two. And in strategic objective number three is to improve access to essential commodities and supplies that are relevant to obstetric hemorrhage. And the fourth one is to improve the health skin behavior of the women and their families for maternal and newborn health. 
with focus on obstetric hemorrhage. I'm going to take through each one of them and pick one or two activities which we as examples, but you read in details if, uh, in the next slide. The strategic objective number one is to strengthen leadership, accountability, and policy environment for management of maternal and newborn health with a focus on obstetric hemorrhage. The intended results for us is we want a conducive policy environment for reproductive maternal and newborn health, adolescent health with a focus on obstetric hemorrhage. And here is wanted policies on ground, one strategies on ground and guidelines in place, like what we're doing today. We want at least a very special health facility to have this guideline so that you have where to refer to. The other one is having a functional coordination and accountability platforms for MNH. And I would like to attest to this, like for example, the, the Thursday meeting is an coordination platform it is also accountability platform we're also encouraging that the different regions like in eastern region i know awogu is a strong for um, has a lot of regional platform but you want to see how do you bring the midwives plus all and the doctors on board so that they are they are informed on what is happening those are accountability platforms for us to discuss some of these mnh conditions but also to learn from each other. And under this intended results, the existence of a reliable financing mechanisms that prioritize obstetric hemorrhage management. And the, this is aligned with the Ministry of Health, but, but also the IPs being on board to basically support us. And knowledge management implemented focusing on obstetric hemorrhage. So these are some of the outputs which we believe if we made the environment conducive for each one of us, you'll have these outputs. Those are four of them, which I've just listed. There are many others which are in the book. And I wanted just in the next slide to share with you one or two activities under the strategic objective. For example, under uh, the strategic of the output policies, strategies, and guidelines, one activity which we most often emphasize and encourage people, the clinicians, the ones here and online is, are we able to conduct our maternal death reviews within seven days when it happens? This is one of the activities. And you being champions of MNH in the Eastern region, can we support this process? You have seen the commissioner more often saying, we want this health facility to, um, help us review those days so that we can have a 100% review of all the maternal days. Not to victimize, but to help people learn from the process, but also to help people uh, be accountable and uh, for every maternal death so that we can have a complete record in our country. The other activity is the review and update of essential maternal and newborn health guidelines protocols and job aids with a focus on updating OH management. This is already done, and we're glad that we're sharing those guidelines today with the Eastern region. It was already shared in Bali. Uh, we could give ourselves a tick there, and we're disseminating those updated guidelines, and we want it to reach to the lowest facility. That's including health center tools, but also, what is important for us is to disseminate the commodities redistribution guidelines. Uh, you find one facility has uh, expiry of blood. Is there a way we can work together such that when somebody knows that this drug or this commodity is almost about to expire, can I share it with Ginger Hospital, which has a high patient load? that we don't waste any drug. So these are some of the activities we believe that all the facilities should be able to know. They um, a list of them in the in the hard copy and then in the soft copy, which you people should, I, I request that you, you refer to them. Next slide. 
And a strategic objective too, that speaks to strengthening the capacity of health facilities to provide MNE services. Um, the intended result here is improved capacity to offer MO, uh, emergency of surgical and newborn care. And the, some of the outputs here is we want the facilities to have adequate and competent human resource. That this health center too has the, the adequate number of midwives. The health center three has the doctor and eye anesthetist on board to be functional. This is one of the intended outputs. And the other one is adequate and appropriate and functional equipment for the management of obstetric hemorrhage. Uh, for Eastern region, uh, Chai, I wanted to mention one thing about uh, the use of uh, NASMEC and non mnemonic and shock garments, which are available. They procure them, and you believe you'll most of the facilities will be receiving them. And we want people to use them when they are referring cases, especially when somebody is in shock. Hmm? And they should be taught how to use them. And uh, it has been found to save the lives of mothers. People who joined early were able to watch a video, maybe during break time, you, the, the, the secretary should screen that video on how to apply the non mnemonic and shock garment, especially when you are waiting for the intervention. The other output is a functional and accessible effect, efficient referral system. This is really coming up. COVID-19 taught us a lot and the Ministry of Health has taken it up. And I believe every district has a referral focal person. Let's get to know what they are, their numbers are, and reach out to them when you have a difficulty in referring the case. A safe and appropriate infrastructure facilities with essential amenities. This is one of uh, the other output. Next slide, I just want to mention some few activities, for example, under the existence of adequate competent human skills mix. One of the things we believe is that we need to know our numbers. Can we conduct a, a baseline survey on to know how many doctors we have per facility? What is the skills? and uh, uh, with a focus on obstetric hemorrhage. And then also not to forget the ambulance drivers, because sometimes you think they are less important than when you have a referral. You don't have a driver and yet you have a vehicle with you. We need to know these critical cadres when it comes to management of what MNA cases. The other activities, training and mentorship, and I'm glad there are a good number of mentors on who are joining this meeting. But the, the things which you pass on to the lower cadres when you work with them makes them retain them. It is easy to distribute the guidelines, but if you work with them, then make things uh, uh, basically stick more. And when you hold one junior's hand and say, this is how we manage you try not Tony. And now we have the new commodities of heat stable carbetosin and transnamic acid on board. There are several questions which uh, the junior might not be able to really articulate, but if it is, the mentors are there, then you are able to pick that. And the training institutions should be able to pick this up with their tutors and the, the lecturers and the rest, so that we have these people equipped adequate enough. The other activity is the establishment of skills lab. Uh, there are certain conditions which are very rare and you can only have it demonstrated in the skills labs. In the re uh, referral hospitals, the ginger people, is your skills lab working and the Mbale people, you post it on chat and see if your skills lab is working. The, one of the things we believe is that if there are people who are willing to support this, they need us just to, to echo it out and shout out to them. They will be able to say, okay, we can get for you some manicures. And you establish basically a skills lab with some SOPs on how to manage some of the conditions. Then you are able to basically move. Next slide. 
Under strategic objective number three, that speaks to improving access to essential commodities and supplies relevant to the management of static hemorrhage. The intended out uh, results is improved access by clients to essential commodities and supplies. And one of the outputs is having an efficient functional network of blood and blood transfusion services at all levels. And I want you people to get annoyed and say, you need these things functional and speak about it, speak about it several times. Don't get tired if the system is down, if there are no reagents, there should be people who are able to help us. Two is having uninterrupted access to effective commodities for management of obstetric hemorrhage. Can we have oxytocin all the time on ground? Can we have a gometry in few doses, mysoprostol available, that we don't need to send patients to, to pick drugs from what, from the pharmacy? which are very close to the hospitals now because they know where we're having shortages. And the other one is access to effective and appropriate technologies for management of obstetric hemorrhage. These are the outputs few which I've just picked out. For example, in the next slide, I'll just show you the activities. Uh, when you look at um, issues to do with functionalizing the network for blood and blood transfusion services. One is having blood banks in all regional referral hospitals. And the two is the functionalizing blood storage and distribution centers at district level is another activity. And then for the smoke facilities, for you to establish blood storage facilities. If you have a blood storage, then you can easily request for blood from, from the distribution center or from the blood, uh, blood banks in your region that you're able to do your cesarean section comfortably without necessarily referring. And if, for example, you don't have the blood group, blood transfusion service has been emphasizing that instead of you referring a patient to Mbalo Hospital or referring it to Ginger Hospital, can you send for blood so that you're able to operate this woman near her family where she can be able to get support? Next slide. Strategic objective number four, which speaks to improving health skin behavior of women and their families for maternal and newborn health services. One, the intended results output is we want to improve the literacy of our communities requiring not only obstetric hemorrhage, but even others. And I want to inform the members present here that uh, I want to request you people to, to be volunteers to some of these talk shows. Most districts, or almost all, have airtime for health. Let's use that opportunity. You are the one with the knowledge, and you'll be able to disperse some of the, dispel some of the myths about certain conditions so that we can have an informed commodity, uh, community, they can seek services early now. Under this strategy objective, internal output is increased ANC services to eight visits according to the revised guidelines, but also to increase birth preparedness and complication readiness of our women. Uh, I like one of my teachers uh, uh, took key components out of that birth preparedness and complication readiness, that if we can tell the woman that prepare some money to use during delivery, do you know where to deliver from? If those two can be taken care of, we could be able to improve these women seeking care because most women reach nine months and they don't know where they are likely to deliver from and they don't have any money. And the worst scenario is where she comes and Dr. Sam Mononge starts asking her where the clothes to receive the baby. And the next thing, the woman surrenders her cloth for giving the baby warm. But if she had prepared enough, she would be confident to pull those things out. The other output is increased skilled birth attendance and institutional delivery. Currently, we're standing at 73, but we want to reach 
at least above 90, an increased postnatal care service utilization so that these women can access family planning and uh, also increased level of involvement of men in seeking care. Please, when men come in, the attitude or the strategy we should be using is that try to involve this man, even if you can take this man's blood pressure alone and you continue with the rest of the things with the woman. That is very, very good enough. Don't just leave them under the tree or try to engage them if there are any, anything you can do for them, that will be good. You'll see the smile in his face and next time you'll bring this woman again that my pressure was measured last time. And then the other one is increased output to is increased contraceptive use among women of reproductive age. In the next slide, I've just pointed out a few activities. Um, next slide. And uh, output number one of improving literacy or maternal and newborn health is um, Minister of Health is trying to develop talking points, have them translated, printed, and distributed possibly uh, in all the in all the regions, such that it's easy for us to have standardized messages. If you are talking about preeclampsia in the eastern region, you are talking about the same thing in the western region. So these messages which are being developed and also makes it easy for somebody if you are being called, come and talk about PPH. You have it ready and you're able to air basically the same thing. Uh, we need to mobilize and engage people outside, uh, we, uh, outside the health who have a very, very big influence in health seeking behavior. These are cultural, religious and political leaders such that they can be able to be our advocates and ambassadors. In, in Jinja region, Busoga region, can we involve the, the religious people? You know, when they speak, the community listens to them so much. Similarly, in Elgon region, the, the cultural leaders around that area, there is where the, the audience appeals to them more than you as a health. Because we, sometimes we have been labeled, given a, a bad label, these uh, doctors who want money all the time. But when somebody like him or more speaks, he is not attacked to any, anything happening in the facility. This is where it appeals. Education of masses through radios, televisions is what I had mentioned earlier. Uh, that we need to embrace that so that we're able to reach out to these communities. This way it empowers them to seek care. Next slide. I'm almost coming to the end. So what are some of the achievements? Uh, one is the reduction of institutional maternal mortality rate from 192, that is positive. We have this functional national coordination and accountability platform which happens every week. And people who are logged in here, make sure you get the link and be able to join in. There's a lot of sharing, there's a lot of advocacy, there's a lot of success stories which we can be able to learn from. The guidelines have been updated and they were launched. And today we're glad to say we're disseminating in, in, for the people in uh, Busoga and the Elgon region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are continuing to test our region, I believe, next week or week after. And that should be able to give us a start. But there is a, 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 a roadmap for the dissemination load down up to the health facilities. We are glad to say that one of the, the drugs that hit stabocabitocin was registered by, by NDA and should be available for people to start using once the ministry starts purchasing it. The ministry was trying to use AMCHI funds to get it. It's one of the drugs we sell. Uh, one of us will present ably, and I, I will leave it to that. The qualities of it versus oxytocin is really key. The IEPs have been very supportive 
in recruiting the cadres uh, where you have your IP and you don't have an ICC. Some of them have come in to basically support those regions for one or two years as the minister basically takes it up. Next slide. The functionalization of health center force is from this advocacy. I don't need to repeat it. And uh, some IPs in supporting implementation, like for example, the distribution of guidelines. We need to ride with the IPs to ensure that they, they help these guidelines to reach to the intended users. The mentorship and skills training conducted by the AMCHIP is one other achievement, which we believe uh, is attributed to this NASMEC uh, platform. And then monthly webinars on the different uh, components. Um, this week, actually, we're having a preeclampsia webinar, which is the, on Thursday, that is tomorrow. Please ensure you join, and they're sharing the guidelines on, on the preeclampsia. Mm -hmm. and we shall alert you when we're having the observatory more guidelines. We shared it last, I think, around November. And then also, the Uganda blood transfusion is innovating to reduce unnecessary referrals due to blood shortage by ensuring that blood is available to the lowest level, which is uh, uh, supposed to have. And then also creating media awareness is key. I would like to thank all the people who have volunteered themselves to create this media awareness, especially this month when we had the, the preeclampsia launch and and the preeclampsia month. Next slide. So what is my responsibility and what is your responsibility? Minutes of Health is providing with us the technical guidance and the supportive environment, which is really key, but also helping us with the uh, mobilizing resources. And for the National Safe Motherhood and NPSR Committee, we are trying to coordinate and oversee the implementation of this intervention. So when we ask you, say we want you to go and mentor this facility, we want you to work with this uh, midwife, please, these are some of the things we do as a coordination platform, which you, all of us should maybe partner with. The developing partners are giving us the resources, but I want to go down to the health facilities you as OBG1 midwives, nurses, please provide the infrastructure for us to improve quality of maternity care within the facilities, but also use these evidence-based guidelines mm -hmm. to manage conditions. Uh, as somebody mentioned earlier, other people are using old guidelines. Can we remove them from the shelves and put them in the cupboard somewhere stored away. Can we have these new guidelines available for people to use too? I also encourage you to, to link up to the Minister of Health portal because most of these guidelines are going to be posted there so that you can be able to download them. On the other side, academia is continue doing research and advocacy and implementation and the training of, of, for the pre-service, which is really key. And for who want us to use the parliamentarians, if you if you have a good relationship with some parliamentarians, speak to them about allocation of resources, but also to hold the district accountable. We have had challenges of uh, recruitment of some critical cadres, but if you use your politicians, that should be really key. And meanwhile, the community is to increase demand for the services if they are informed. Next slide, this is my last slide. Just to appreciate all of you from Elgon and Busoga region for joining on today's dissemination, but also to appreciate the different stakeholders which are listed here, but more to appreciate Ferring Pharmaceuticals, which gave us the funding to start this process. The, the Minister of Health is bring out the hard copy. So be expectant, like a pregnant lady, they will arrive in your facility. Thank you so much for joining. And I will welcome some questions in the course. I will remain online most of the time. Thank you. Over to you, Chair.
Thank you so much, Dr. Ondonge, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, right now we can get questions from the physical participants. And then I'll also entertain questions from the virtual participants too. Thank you, Dr. Nonge, my, my teacher. Uh, this is Dr. Nakendo, Bujiro Hospital, gynecologist. Now, um, thanks for the presentation. One, you present about your your presentation, the result framework, and also partly on the logic framework. But uh, my issue goes to the result framework. I feel, you know, we are talking about results, result framework. I feel in this, should I say organogram or with arrows? I feel you left out the issue of uh, data, the HMIS, and I feel we, we results do with data. Data gives results. Then also in this result framework, I felt you'd also emphasize the issue of MPDSR. Well, you have brought it in the achievements and also in the logic framework, but I feel it should also have been included in this result framework. Data, that's HMS and also the MPDSR. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nakendo. I hope Dr. Nonge is capturing the questions. You will answer at once. Dr. Nkalu. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ankalu from Jinja Regional Referral. Um, issues, referral, PPH. Referral meaning uh, three times chances of dying. Our experience, uh, we've seen that uh, referral seems to be now an end in itself. Once a facility X has made a decision to refer, there is no ongoing care from the time the decision is made to the time the patient reaches the referral destination. On top of that, you find that uh, some of the referrals are not well coordinated. Uh, Busoga region, we are getting better and better at coordinating our referrals. But when you look at other places, a referral letter is written and the patient is referred to as a referral. It might even take six hours before that patient leaves the facility. So uh, when you uh, look at the logical framework, enhancing uh, ambulance services might not be the key issue here. The key issue will be having ambulance services and a tailored ongoing care from the time the decision is made to the time the patient is handed over. On top of that, the referral must be coordinated. Short of that, we've seen ambulances available, but still the result is that mothers are still dying once they are referred. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ankarivo. Uh, the issue is about referral, referral, referral. Uh, yes, as I'm getting other questions, I need to introduce to you Dr. Kenny. Dr. Kenny, you can just stand up for recognition. Dr. Kenny is the person who was behind the launch in Bali. Probably we could clap for him and the whole entire Bali team. Thank you so much for the work you did. And the ceremony was really in high, in high, high vibes. Uh, any other questions from the team here? Then also for the people who came a little bit late, I'd love to reintroduce the president. The president is right here with us. You can wave at the people, Dr. Unsad. Yes, I thought the president was going to do this, but he did this. Thank you so much. Um, so we can take the, the questions also from the online people so that Dr. Nonge can answer at once.
So Dr. Nonge, someone, uh, he's called Akango Dokas Joseph. Good presentation, please can you send us the soft copy? Of, and then how can I join tomorrow presentation on preeclampsia? Can you send me the link on this same number? Over to you, Dr. Nonge. Thank you, uh, Adija. And uh, I would like to start with the Dr. Abubakar Akendo. It is one, we have not missed out data. Uh, although it is not complete in the hard copy, it is something which is within there that we need. It is the flow of data from the facilities is really very, very key in the framework. It is included, including MPDSR. MPDSR, strategic objective number one, talks about leadership, accountability uh, of the services. And MPDSR is basically speaking into how do we improve accountability of the our responsibilities as we are given as clinicians, as uh, public health workers within the different facilities. So it is not out. So within there, you need to look at uh, the detailed uh, framework. Uh, the, as regards uh, Dr. Nkalba from Ginger, yes, referral. Uh, Kawimpe is not the same where I work. And sometimes you find that somebody because he's fearing a death in the facility, he says refer. And from the time the referral is made to time the patient arrives, nothing is done. In the worst case scenarios, even what they were attempting to do, they disconnected, they removed the drip, everything, and then they say go to the next level. I'm glad that the Minister of Health has developed some SOPs. I haven't looked at them. But they are learning from the referral process within the urban setting in Kampala, where they emphasize that before you refer, you need to communicate to the receiving facility. So if, for example, uh, Nalfenya Health Center, if there is one and in that name, is referring to Ginger Hospital, can they call Ginger Hospital and say, we have this condition? And the ginger people should be able to advise and say, okay, although you are sending her, currently we don't have what it requires to manage her. Meanwhile, can you institute ABCD? So that to avoid even empty referrals. There's sometimes where you find that instead of you referring to ginger hospital, maybe you refer to Nyenga, which has a certain um, ability to manage certain condition other than referring to ginger, and then ginger now starts referring basically to what in, to Nyenga because that facility is not in, in ginger. So the emphasis here is how do we coordinate, how do we improve communication between facilities during referral? Do we need even to refer? If sometimes you need something other than you referring the case, can you deliver this woman if it is a delivery? I'm sending for you blood, which I'm dispersing the ambulance as a new, uh, a, making a patient travel without care for about six uh, six hours. So it is uh, very key what you mentioned. And as you nurse make, one of the our responsibilities is to see how do we disseminate these referral guidelines so that people are able to have them. If people have them, they know the focal person, this person should be able to coordinate between facilities. That is this case which you are sending. What is the case? Can we prepare? Even the people in Ginger will be able to prepare and say, okay, there's a bad case coming, ruptured uterus. Can you have theater nearby and the doctors are available basically to manage this condition? Slowly, slowly through these platforms like the Busoga region, the Elgon region, those are some of the things who we believe you will be discussing when it comes to the monthly meetings which you have or a quarterly meetings, which I believe we'll be able to organize. Over to you, Adija.
to answer us. Uh, maybe doctor, you someone had a question about on an online participant was asking about the webinar. The webinar was pushed to Saturday, so it is not tomorrow. And when the link is available, we shall be able to 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 dis, uh, to, to distribute it out. Um, maybe before I invite Dr. Susan, Sister Liz, you have something. Thank you so much, Sister Hadija and Dr. Ononge for the presentation. Yeah, uh, one of our strategies in reduction of obstetrical hemorrhage is uh, male involvement. Uh, some time back, we had that strategy in MCH as a male involvement in reproductive health services, male involvement in antenatal care, but it's like, it's not working out. But for this cause of obstetrical hemorrhage, I think we need to reimburse it. What strategies do you think we can put in place to involve men? Thank you. Good enough, the question has been addressed to a man. Dr. Nongi, what strategies have you put in place to involve yourself or to involve the men anyway? <laughs> Over to you, Dr. Nongi. I'm glad that there are also men in the house hmm? and the senior men in the house. But what I, I mentioned earlier is one, I'll give you one example. If I came to the clinic, and the, my wife is taken in and you talk to her, I wait for her outside. The next time is she comes out and we go home. I have not been engaged a lot. They, is there a way we can engage him? When you are talking to this woman, can he be available? And two is that, can we offer some basic service to this man? Like measuring the blood pressure is a good example for us to bring them basically on board. Two is that we, we need to reach out to them from wherever they are working. In urban setting, these people are either in the market, they are in the garages where they are. If we're able to speak to them, that also makes them be accountable that we need to support, uh, support our women. And the, for those able to using the VHTs, the VHTs to reach these men in their homes with messages, Basically, because if a VHT has a simplified message about the dangers of excessive bleeding after childbirth and just shares with this man in his home, that is will enable this man basically to act what he act actually early. There is a male involvement strategic plan, detailed one by Minister of Health. I believe we can share it with the members, download it before the end of this meeting that they should be able to get. There are several activities within there which speak to male involvement. I will leave to other men, senior men in the house to speak to what they are doing in their different facilities to involve men. Over at you, Adija. Okay. So I believe we no longer have any questions. Oh, sister. And also on a special note, we want to appreciate Awugu for bringing, Dr. Msana, thank you so much for bringing the midwives on board, because we all know that the midwives are the critical cadres that we are always talking about. Eh? Yes, and thank you so much for supporting them always. Thank you, Dr. Sam Onongi. I'm Namso Margaret. <clears throat> One of the causes for the women who die of OH, you talked of the delays, but in our communities, we have got the TBS. They attend to these mothers and so, sometimes they make late referrals. What strategies have you put in place to sensitize these TBS to refer mothers early? Dr. Nunge, over to you. Okay, that question I'm going to refer to the Busoga region. I remember it came up in the MPDSR uh, Thursday meeting, the TBS are many. 
what is making these women go to TBS? It could be what we are doing at Health Facilities. Is there something which is sending these women to the TBS? Is there a way we can attract them to come and deliver at a health facility? Then we can be able to bring these more women from TBS. Two is that we need to engage these TBS. Most times we have harassed them, but if we work together with them, emphasizing that you keeping the mother there is not a good thing, but to, if you can be a helper to accompany them to the facility, that would be okay. Because some cases would bypass a health facility and go to TB across the other side of the facility, which is very unfortunate. What are you doing in your facility? is testing this woman to go to what it might just be respect for the maternity born care tbs talk to these women very nice they welcome them they greet them talk to them for us we will just say go and lie there oh it's time for you to be examined you don't even ask for permission hmm? you just examine so those are some of the small small things hmm? which what we describe as respectful and dignified care during childbirth if a woman has a good experience at your facility, she will tell another she will come next time. I bet you. But if she's mistreated, she's asked for money for any procedure which is done, she will go to where she's not asked for money, but she will give you a bunch of matoke or a chicken later after she has been offered a service. So we need to improve our respectful and mother newborn care and i'm glad adija who is one of the leaders of the midwives is championing the training on respectful maternal newborn care we need to change professionalism within our facilities does it pay to talk rudely to a woman does it talk to her nicely and explain to her every condition she will come back to your facility she will not go to tb TBS are not supported by Ministry of Health. We need to see how do we outcompete them by the way we act. And it takes very little. Over to you, Adija. Maybe you'll share with them what, what the, uh, the association is doing to, to implement respect for maternity newborn care. Okay. Dr. Musana, before I, I, I come in to talk about the association and maybe about my EML project, let me first invite Dr. Musana to say something. I would like to, sorry, I would like to thank Dr. Nonge for presenting the framework, really. I think a framework is just a structure which is not closed. So when they give you a frame of a house, you can then design it. That they have put for you the, the pillars, like this building has pillars. Imagine there are no walls, but they've said on this pillar, innovate about leadership. On this pillar, innovate about research. On this pillar, so much as the framework is there, it is not a stiff document. It is only giving you a guidance on the areas that you should be innovative about. So you may find the Mbari may be unique in its own setting, so their innovations may be different, but will fit in the pillar. And they can place a wall there and say for us, our mothers are dying of preeclampsia, so these are the innovations we have made. Maybe difficult, maybe different from Kampala, but all of them should have a pillar in which they fit and how they design. Now on the issue of TBAs, I don't think we support TBAs. We are saying women should deliver with skilled birth attendance. Uh, so you may find that sometimes maybe our care, as Dr. Nonge said, is not respectful. And I think even LG is going into a pillar of respectful care, maternal care, so that our mothers, when they come to the facilities, they should actually choose to come to us. But if they are choosing a TBA, we need to look and see what is happening internally as to why they would choose the TBA. But just a, a framework on the, sorry, the framework is not a closed document. It's not like saying uh, oxytocin is for prevention, give Amstel. No, the framework just gives you guidance that in, these are the areas you need to look at, but build them, complete the building according to your needs, 
and challenges. So if I have to jump a river to attend to a mother, then I build a bridge. Others may build roads, others may use flights. Thank you so much, President. That is well said. About respectful maternity care, there are a lot of issues that are coming up. And of course, these issues are not raised to the doctors, they are raised to the midwives as midwives. So this is supposed to be something, uh, actually, this is something that the association has taken up. And I personally, I am, I am supported by ICM to run a two years project to train midwives on respectful maternity care. So we want uh, the midwives to support us, support the association, so that we see how we bring these mothers closer to us. Okay, but there is no big reason. They don't go to these TBS because they have the skills, because they have the knowledge. No, it is that little tap, that little massage that they give them. It is what is making them to go that side. Otherwise, I believe when we change our attitude, we, uh, we treat them respectfully, they will come to us. Okay, um, I have been told that our break is ready, but before we go for the break, I would love to recognize the regional coordinator, Aogo, and I'm giving her only two minutes to say something to us. Mm -hmm. Doctor, you're welcome. Okay. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Uh, my apologies for coming in late, uh, but you're all welcome to the Soga region. Uh, those from Mbale, I don't see anyone from Soroti, Teso, uh, Kavera Maido, Busia, but they were all invited. And even on Zoom, they are not present, but you are all very welcome. I hope you didn't get lost while coming here and feel at home. Uh, there are many issues that are going on in our region. We are seeing our mothers dying. Dr. Ankaluvo can attest to that. And it's mainly because of lack of blood products and the essential commodities. I don't know what the Minister of Health is going to do for us, but we are running out of gloves, out of stitches, out of pitocin, and the common, common anesthetic drugs like ketamine. I don't know whether your regions were given, but in Kamuli, apparently for the past six months, we haven't received. And you are all aware that ketamine is not an off-shelf drug. And people are buying undercover. And we even don't know how safe these drugs are, but we are continuing to buy them. So Mr. President, our region is suffering and our women are continuing to die because we are not able to give the interventions in time. We want to use this platform to echo out our challenges at different sites, at different regions or districts. And um, like they said, we need to highlight the facilities in our regions that are not functional, especially the health center falls, so that we are able to follow up and uh, give the relevant authorities for further support. Uh, we also have issues with TBA. They talked about Wusoga region. Sister Hadija, I think you are truly aware of what is happening. I can give an example of my district. We have tried to advocate for institutional delivery. We have brought services nearer to the people, especially with this RBF. Outreaches are many, uh, the mothers are motivated, they're given a cup of tea, they are given even soap and linen. But these women continue to go to the TBAs. And the most unfortunate thing is that we do not have a political will to fight them. We have even seen prominent politicians in Kamuli dying at the hands of the TBA. So I'm really not sure how far we are going to go because even some were closed, but still they are open up to this day. So we are fighting a dead end. And I think uh, Mr. President, sir, that one should also be put as one of the key risk factors for our mothers. Because sometimes they come with ruptured uterus or badly, severely neglected, obstructed 
uh, labor. So if you try to save this woman, she gets very severe comorbidities, stay for over a month in hospital. We are seeing sepsis that we stopped seeing in the 90s. You know, in this era, women, it's really too much. And um, I can't say much about it, but the issue of TBS in Soga region, I don't know about in Bali whether you also have them, but ours are too many and we need help. Um, with those few remarks, I would like to appreciate everyone who has come and attended physically. And those of you who have tried to mobilize your entire team, please thank you. And we pray that you preach the gospel of PPH management. If we all improved, we could save almost 90% of all the deaths that are happening to mothers during labor and delivery. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Susan, for the welcome remarks. I, I think at this juncture, we should go for break tea. That should take us about 30 minutes, and then we'll come for the session thereafter. We already prayed for everything. Let's just go for it. No greater tragedy than the death of a... There is no greater joy than the birth of a child, and no greater tragedy than the death of a mother during childbirth. As often as 1,000 times a day, a mother dies giving birth. The leading direct cause of maternal mortality is hemorrhage. Women rapidly go into shock from hemorrhage, but they die from delays. Delays in finding transport, delays during transport, and delays waiting for definitive care in referral facilities. What can save these mothers is a low-cost, reusable, easy-to-apply first aid device, the NASG a non-pneumatic anti-shock garment made of neoprene and Velcro. By compression, the NASG stops bleeding and keeps blood in the vital organs during shock. The Safe Motherhood Program at the University of California, San Francisco has demonstrated that the NASG buys time that helps mothers survive delays. The NASG is a lightweight compression suit made of neoprene and Velcro with six segments that close around the ankle, calf, thigh, pelvis, and abdomen. The Velcro fastenings keep the garment on tightly. The abdominal segment, number five, contains a small foam ball to apply pressure to the uterus. Anyone can be trained to apply the NASG. First, place the NASG under the woman. The top of the NASG should be at the level of her lowest rib, and the row of yellow dots should be along her spine. 
starting at the ankles, close segment number one tightly around each ankle. Make sure it is tight enough so that you can snap it and hear a sharp sound. Next, close segment number two. Try to leave the woman's knee free so she can bend it. Are you okay, madam? Apply segment number three, the thigh segment, in the same way as one and two. Apply segment number four, the pelvic segment, all around the woman at the level of the pubic bone. Play segment number five, with the pressure ball, madam, okay. directly over the umbilicus. Then close the NASG with segment number six. Although two people can more rapidly close the leg segments, only one person should close the pelvic and abdominal segments, four, five, and six, to avoid applying too much pressure. All segments should be applied using as much strength as possible. However, do not close the abdominal segment so tightly that it restricts the woman's breathing. Are you breathing okay? If the source of bleeding appears to be uterine atony, administer uterotonic drugs and massage the uterus. The NASG stretches, allowing room for your hand. The NASG adapts to many sizes of women. Here, for demonstration purposes, we are applying it to a fully clothed model who weighs 227 pounds, 103 kilograms. The NASG can also be used on a shorter woman. First, place the top of the NASG at the level of her lowest rib. Without closing the Velcro, check that the ball in the number five and six panel will be over the umbilicus. Now, move to the woman's feet. Check to see if the NASG extends beyond her feet. If so, then the NASG is too long. To shorten it, fold segment number one back inside segment number two. Then start with segment number two at the ankles. Continue with the rest of the segments as on a taller woman. It takes two people to apply the NASG to an unconscious woman. Use the same principle as making an occupied bed. Turn the woman on her side. Fold the NASG in half along the dotted line. Fold the abdominal and pelvic segments, four and six, so the Velcro is inside and won't stick. Place the top of the NASG at the level of her lowest rib and place the dotted line along her spine. Push the flat half of the abdominal and pelvic segments with the Velcro folded to the inside under her body. Next, roll the woman to her other side. Have the second person pull out the flat half of the abdominal and pelvic segments. Roll the woman on her back. Recheck the placement of the NASG by placing the ball, without closing segments five and six, over her umbilicus. Then, begin closing the NASG, starting at the ankles. The NASG buys time to transport women to facilities where definitive care is given. Ambulance drivers and others who help transport hemorrhaging women can easily learn to apply the NASG. The NASG can be left in place while any vaginal procedure is performed. Surgery to obtain hemostasis can also be performed with the NASG in place. The abdominal and pelvic segments must be open, but only immediately before the first incision. Prepare the operating theater and personnel for surgery. The anesthesiologist or anesthetist must be aware that the blood pressure will drop as soon as the NASG segments are open. Open only segments 4, 5, and 6. Close segments 4, 5, and 6 as soon as the procedure is complete. Using a clothed model, here's how to help a woman in the NASG to urinate or defecate. Slide segment number four up and out of the way in the back, which will allow her to use the bedpan or toilet. You may help the woman raise her hips while you slide segment number four up along her back. Then slide the bedpan under her and help her into a sitting position. Or you may roll the woman onto her side. Slide segment number four up along her back, then roll her onto her back and place the bedpan under her. Help her to a sitting position. 
When she's finished, lower segment number four back into place. Do not remove the NASG. If the NASG becomes badly soiled with blood and the woman needs to keep it on, you may change her into a clean NASG gradually so that compression is not lost. Slide a fresh, clean NASG under the woman. Position it so the top of the NASG is at the level of her lower ribs. Starting at the ankle, open the soiled NASG and roll the soiled number one segments up and out of the way. Close the clean NASG number one segments on the ankles. Next, open the soiled number two segments and roll them up and out of the way. Close the clean number two segments. Continue the same procedure with segments three and four. Segments five and six are the most crucial. To maintain compression, remove these soiled segments and apply the clean segments as quickly as possible. The person standing on the side of the NASG with the foam ball should pull the soiled garment to her. Then immediately secure segments five and six. Put the soiled garment in a biohazard container. The woman is now wearing a clean NASG. Removing the NASG should only be done under medical supervision and with the woman's IV still running. Once the woman's vital signs have been stable at least two hours, with systolic blood pressure greater than 90 millimeters of mercury, the pulse less than 100 beats per minute, and bleeding is less than 50 milliliters per hour, you can begin removal. Even though you have been monitoring vital signs, you must take the blood pressure and pulse immediately before beginning NASG removal. Open segment number one on each ankle. Wait 15 minutes. Recheck blood pressure and pulse. As long as neither has changed by 20, that is, the pulse has not increased by 20 beats per minute, nor the blood pressure decreased by 20 millimeters of mercury, the rule of 20, move on to open segments number two on both legs. Wait 15 minutes. Recheck blood pressure and pulse. If blood pressure and pulse remain stable, remove segments number three. Then continue with four, then five and six, waiting 15 minutes between each segment. If at any time the blood pressure drops by 20 millimeters mercury or more, or the pulse increases by 20 beats per minute or more, stop the removal. Starting with the last segment opened, rapidly reapply all segments from top to bottom and look for the source of bleeding. When the NASG is removed, it should be immediately placed in a plastic, non-leak biohazard receptacle. Always wear heavy rubber utility gloves when handling a contaminated NASG. First, Remove tissue or other body materials by scrubbing with a brush. The next step is to decontaminate the NASG. Prepare a 0.01% bleach solution. Bleach comes in different strengths, so the amount of bleach you'll need to make a 0.01% solution will vary depending on the brand of bleach you're using. The correct mixture may vary from 40 milliliters to 100 milliliters of bleach per 30 liters of water. Refer to this chart, which is in the NASG training toolkit, to determine the correct amount of bleach. Submerge the NASG in the bleach solution for 10 minutes. You may need to place a heavy object, such as a rock, on the NASG to keep it submerged. Next, wash the garment with detergent and cool or warm water by hand or in a washing machine. Do not put it in a drying machine. Hang the NASG to dry. If the NASG is not folded properly, the heavy-duty Velcro will stick to itself or to the NASG and slow down application during an emergency. Place the NASG on a clean, dry surface. Spread it out. Start with segment number one and fold it in on itself so that the Velcro doesn't stick to the colored outside material but is resting on the inside. Fold segments two and three in the same way. Then fold the leg segments together like a map or fan. Place the leg segments all the way into the abdominal segment. 
fold segment number four so that the Velcro is lying on the black, not the colored part. Then fold up over the leg segments inside the abdominal segment. Fold segment number five across the leg segments. Wrap segment number six tightly around segment number five. Once folded correctly, the NASG is ready to be stored in a clean, dry place where it can be visible and easily accessible. In a clear plastic bag if possible. Folded correctly, the NASG is ready to be quickly applied to the next patient who needs it. If you work in a low volume facility or at the community level, you may not see enough patients to remain proficient with the NASG. To be ready for an emergency, practice putting the NASG on each other at least once a month. Then, when a hemorrhaging mother needs the NASG, you'll have the practice and experience to help her. Are you okay, madame? The NASG may not save the life of every mother dying in childbirth, but the initial field data gathered over 10 years in three different studies in Africa show a decline in maternal mortality of over 50% when the NASG was applied. 50%. Okay. A simple, easy to apply, reusable and inexpensive device can save the lives of thousands of mothers every year and help to preserve the health and integrity of their families and communities. For the compression of the abdominal aorta, you should be familiar with the anatomy of the abdominal aorta. The aorta is the big artery which brings blood from the heart to the lower parts of the body. When it passes the umbilical level, it bifurcates into two different portions, one to the left leg and one to the right leg. When a woman is lying in a horizontal position, the aorta runs in the midline. It lies on the hard skeletal structure of the vertebral column. In order to switch off the flow of blood to the uterus, we need to apply pressure on the aorta from the abdominal side and compress the aorta between a closed fist and the vertebral column. Before making any compression, we must also be aware of the anatomical features near the abdominal aorta. For example, if we compress too far up, it can be painful because we might be pressing the liver edge. If we press too far down, it will not cut off the blood flow. We should also keep in mind the position of the uterus. Fortunately, the position of the umbilicus roughly corresponds to the part of the body where the aorta bifurcates and where you need to make the compression. The first step in this procedure is to localize the femoral artery in the right groin. Using your right hand, put three to four fingers in a horizontal position and firmly put pressure on the femoral artery in the right groin. Make sure that you can clearly feel the pulsations there. You must do this to monitor blood flow to the lower parts of the body during the compression. After confirming the pulsation with the right hand in the groin area, Close your left hand into a fist. Make sure that the thumb is outside and not inside in order to create a plain surface which will create a good area for compression. And then, very slowly, at the level of the umbilicus, press your closed fist down until you clearly feel the pulsations of the abdominal aorta. If you do not feel the pulse of the abdominal aorta, move your closed fist slightly to the right or left until you locate it. Then push your closed fist further down, compressing the abdominal aorta between the fist and the anterior wall of the vertebral column. If the compression is successful, 
the right hand will feel the femoral artery pulse disappear. Once the femoral pulse is gone, it means blood is no longer being delivered to the lower parts of the body, including the uterus. This will result in reduced blood loss. If your hands become tired, it is simple to switch the hands by moving to the other side of the patient. After confirming that the compression was successful, continue to apply pressure in the same location and make sure to constantly monitor the femoral pulse. There is nothing dangerous about this technique. Since there is substantial collateral circulation in the pelvic area, there will be no risk of reducing blood flow to other pelvic organs while continuing abdominal aorta compression for hours, even during transport to an emergency obstetric care center if need be. For this technique, it is important to keep in mind that the compression of the abdominal aorta in a postpartum patient is much easier than on a volunteer. This is because, one, since the woman has just delivered, the abdominal wall does not offer any muscular resistance to a compressing fist. Two, due to shock, the woman might even be semi-conscious or drowsy. And three, a woman who has just delivered and whose uterus is bleeding uncontrollably will be in hypovolemic shock and her arterial blood pressure in the aorta will be much lower than normal. This allows the compression of the abdominal aorta to be performed more easily. Let us now review the steps for this technique. 1. Localize and feel the pulsations of the femoral artery in the right groin. 2. Compress the aorta at the level of the umbilicus between a closed fist and the vertebral column. 3. Confirm the disappearance of the femoral pulse in the right groin. 4. Continue to apply pressure and continue to monitor the femoral artery. Always keep in mind that the compression has not solved any other problems related to or causing postpartum hemorrhage. It has only reduced blood loss. In this film, we will firstly explain how to reduce the need for manual removal of placenta and then, if these precautions fail, how to safely perform the manual removal of a placenta. Anemia or weak blood happens if women do not... Medical Aid Films has previously produced a training film which explains what you can do to prevent, recognise and treat postpartum haemorrhage. You are advised to watch that film before this one. Manual removal of the placenta is a procedure that is performed when a woman has a retained placenta. A retained placenta is when the woman does not spontaneously deliver her placenta within 30 minutes of a vaginal delivery. If she is stable and not bleeding heavily, the midwife can wait up to one hour before attempting manual removal of placenta. If she is bleeding heavily after the birth, and the placenta is not out, manual removal of placenta should be performed immediately. When the placenta is retained, it means the uterus cannot contract down and can lead to a postpartum hemorrhage, a serious and potentially life-threatening complication. We now understand that a placenta should be delivered spontaneously within 30 minutes of delivery and that complications can occur if this does not happen. Now it's time to find out how to help the woman deliver the placenta. During labour and in the 30 minutes after delivery, you should encourage the woman to empty her own bladder to assist the spontaneous delivery of the placenta. A catheter should only be used if the woman is unable to pass urine herself. You should then try to get the woman to spontaneously deliver the placenta. If you pull on the cord, you must remember to protect the fundus 
to help prevent uterine inversion. If you pull too hard, the cord will tear away from the placenta. If the cord has already been pulled off, the placenta can still deliver spontaneously and so manual removal of placenta should not be performed until one hour after the delivery of the baby unless the woman is bleeding heavily. So if there is increased blood loss or concern about the woman's condition, then the attempts to deliver spontaneously have failed and you will need to perform a manual removal of placenta. You should be aware that there is a risk of hemorrhage, sepsis, and all We are resuming the after break session. Kindly settle and we start. So we shall be having a, a presentation by Dr. Musaba Milton on prevention and management, uh, prevention and uh, treatment of uh, PPH, including the bundle uh, care approach. Uh, Dr. Milton, you're welcome. Uh, good morning, colleagues. 
still morning. Uh, welcome to this presentation. I have been given the opportunity to walk us through the PPH treatment guidelines. And uh, we are happy to note that these guidelines were launched last week on uh, Saturday in Mbale, as you heard, under the stewardship of uh, Dr. Mugabe, who led the local team that organized this activity. So our interest in this meeting will be specifically in the PPH guidelines. Uh, this replaces the previous guideline. I think the previous guideline was of 2016. So uh, we've already heard what has been discussed earlier, what the definition of PPH is, uh, how do we classify the PPH, what are the predisposing factors, or what are the causes, how to make a diagnosis, which investigations we should do. All this content is included in uh, this guideline. You are well aware that there are several definitions for postpartum hemorrhage. And currently, the one where emphasis is put is the one that puts the patient past. What is the condition of the patient? Not putting a lot of emphasis on the amount of blood that has been lost, because as you are aware, that is very subjective and it might not uh, be directly linked to outcomes. Because what I call a small amount of blood lost, another person might call it a lot of blood lost. We also know that depending on what HB the patient uh, starts to bleed with, their response or their deterioration clinically will vary widely. So the new guideline stresses the importance of utilizing the mother's condition. What is the blood pressure? What is the pulse rate? What is the urine output? And what is the level of consciousness? Again, uh, we know that there are two kinds of types of PPH, primary postpartum hemorrhage and secondary postpartum hemorrhage. Primary being the leading cause of maternal morbidity and mortality in our setting. This is a, a grab from the guideline, the book that has been put out. So the most important thing to know is that uh, each and every woman that comes under your care is at risk of developing postpartum hemorrhage. And that's why it is important that for each and every patient that comes under your care, they receive active management of third stage of labor, I'm still. And that is our first concept of the band of care concept. So we know that if we give oxytocin, 10 international units, I am within a minute of delivery when we are sure that there is no other baby, if we do controlled cord traction and massage the uterus after childbirth, we will prevent up to 80% of the causes of primary postpartum hemorrhage. And on that slide, we see that the leading causes of primary postpartum hemorrhage are uterine atone, trauma, retained tissues, and then the coagulation problems. But it's important to note that the last cause, the last T, can actually arise as a result of atone, trauma, or tissue if the actions and interventions are not decisive. Someone could have uterine atone, and if they bleed and reach some critical step, they develop a DIC, and they'll end up with a coagulation disorder. So as colleagues have already mentioned earlier, sometimes, many times actually, the type three delay in the health facility, the delay to take a decision and intervene 
usually makes things worse. So we have to keep that at the back of the mind, of our minds. And that's where the concept of uh, bundle care, a band of care comes in. So I checked out what, the, what does a band of care mean. And from the library, uh, this means a collection of interventions. And these interventions are usually evidence-based interventions that can be applied in the management of a particular condition. And one of those that we have here is the active management of third stage of labor to prevent primary postpartum hemorrhage due to uterine atony. So if we prevent the PPH, then we will not have to struggle managing the PPH or treating the postpartum hemorrhage. But in case it happens, as the guideline is showing, and we need, we have identified that this woman has developed primary postpartum hemorrhage, then we need to come in and treat the primary postpartum hemorrhage. And as you've seen on this chart, usually the first thing is call for help. Now call for help has been left there in the open and many of us have implemented it in different ways. So in some places, when most cases you are alone and when you say call for help, the bath attendant leaves the patient and runs to go and look for help. So one of the things we are saying is that let's buy a bell and put it in the health facility. When you hear that bell ringing, you know that there is primary postpartum hemorrhage. We are going back to P3, P2, where we work on a clockwork. Instead of abandoning the patient to go and run for help. This is one of the things that was suggested during the development of these guidelines because people are saying, but how do you call for help without endangering the patient, endangering meaning abandoning the patient to go and look for someone. So someone said, by the way, we can ring a bell. Ring a bell and once you hear it in a facility, you know that there's a problem and you need to go. Of course, I will speak to that later on, but it, this means that there has to be facility preparedness so that everyone in the facility knows that when you hear a bell coming from labor ward, know that River Nile has opened the gates. So after calling for help, the next thing that you need to do, so there are two components when we are managing this postpartum hemorrhage. There's the emergency care that you need to institute. And there is a band of care, what we are calling the first response band of care. And the first item in this is to massage the uterus. And you can, if you notice that this is emanating from the active management of third stage of labor, this is the third cardinal step. So we know physiologically that after the uterus has contracted, it keeps relaxing and contracting. And we have to keep palpating for or feeling this uterus to keep it in a contracted uh, state. So this is one, according to the WHO, they say in the first two hours after childbirth, you need to be checking the blood pressure, checking the pulse, massaging the uterus every 15 minutes for two hours. In most cases, we do not have enough manpower to implement that. But the mothers can be a very good resource that we can use to keep feeling for their uterus. Feel this hard ball in the abdomen, and if it is soft, please, let us know. So that is one of the evidence-based interventions that can help to keep the uterus contracted. Of course, when there's PPH, as you're massaging the uterus, make sure that you give oxytocin, 10 international units. Notice that now it is IV and not IM. Or if you have access to misoprostol, you can give up to 800 micrograms sublingually. Uh, I hope this is not an error. Rectally, the rectal root is discouraged for giving misoprostol. Chair, I hope you've noted that. We need to delete that word rectal. 
because again, there's work that has shown that when the misoprostol is given rectally, it takes longer for absorption to happen and uh, for you to achieve enough concentrations in the blood to be able to sort this condition out. So it should only be sublingual root. Uh, egometrin. Egometrin is no longer being brought by NMS. I don't know how it made its way here. It's coming back. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. IV access. We need two large bore cannulas to give ringers lactate on normal saline. You notice that 5% uh, dextrose is not there. But again, there are those challenges of that Dr. Kizala was talking about. Most times these fluids are not readily available. But ringers lactate is the best fluid that we have. If you don't have it, the next best option is what? Normal saline. Of course, we need to take off blood for grouping and cross matching to secure at least two units and do a CBC. CBC will give you other parameters besides the HB. So this has been a big problem, even in where I used to work in Mbari, where we work in Mbari. But sometimes change is good. So we have uh, the current manager of the regional blood bank in Mbari. Uh, was our doctor in Mbale. We did, he did internship in our hospital. So we have incorporated him onto the WhatsApp group of the department of OBS and GAIN. If you've been to Mbale, the, the regional hospital and the regional blood bank are just next door. And we have had, we used to have a lot of problems just getting blood. Actually now the problem is within our hospital blood bank and not the regional blood bank. So when we got him to our platform, we could easily get blood from the blood bank, the regional blood bank. And it created a problem between the regional blood bank and the hospital blood bank. They realized that we had taken, we had found a loop around them. So the results that Dr. Nonge presented there, they are true. And we think that's one of the interventions that helped improve our access to blood. The other thing is that in the past, it appeared like you could not access FPP in Mbale. But now, when we contact him directly, we can get fresh blood and we can get blood products. So it is one, I'm not sure about the anatomy. There's a regional blood bank in Ginger, I think. If you can get that director into the group of your hospital, maybe it can work. So it is kind of informal, but it has helped us partially solve this problem. And we are starting to see results nationally. Uh, five, emptying the bladder, very important intervention. And then again, trinexamic acid, one gram has been shown. This was borrowed from surgery and orthopedics where they were using this to control hemorrhage. And then there was a woman trial that happened in Mulago and all over the world and showed that this given to any kind of PPH, either due to atone, due to retained tissues, and any other kind of surgery you're doing will actually improve on outcomes by reducing the amount of blood lost. So this is the other band of care that we would wish to promote a lot with this guideline, because during the emergency management, when PPH has happened, it can improve outcomes significantly. And from our definition of what a band of care is, each of these points that are listed here, one to five, are evidence-based interventions that can improve or that can be shown to treat postpartum hemorrhage. Again, one thing that comes out very clearly here, you can see that I think uh, all of them, one, two, four, and five are geared towards managing uterine atony. 
And we looked at Amstel, it was also geared towards improving uterine atone. And it's not by mistakes because uterine atone claims most of the mothers and it's the leading cause of primary postpartum hemorrhage. We'll proceed to determining the causes. Now, this has been taught to us many times. There are four T's that cause primary postpartum hemorrhage. Uterine atone, uh, tears, retained tissues, and bleeding disorders. And I want to start with atone, because atone is the leading cause. So we are saying, if you identify what the cause. Sorry about that. Uh, as you are doing emergency management to stabilize this patient, you're also assessing to find out what could be causing this primary postpartum hemorrhage. And common things occur commonly. In most cases, it is usually uterine atone. So if you find that it is uterine atone that is causing the, uh, the PPH, massaging the uterus can help you to solve that problem, to get the uterus to contract. Expelling clots can help to enable the uterus contract and as well as emptying the bladder that we have alluded to earlier. So if you do these two uh, procedures, interventions, massaging the uterus and expelling the clots, in most cases, if it is due to atone, the bleeding will significantly reduce. If the bleeding persists, you move to the use of medication, oxytocin agents. Number one being oxytocin, 20 international units. And usually this oxytocin is administered as 10 international units, IV, bolus. Please make sure that you distinguish that from the 10 international units IM for Amstel. And then the other 10 units is given through an infusion. You can repeat tranexamic acid in case you hadn't given it, in case you had given it earlier, or if you hadn't given it, this is a good time to also give it. And with RBF, many facilities now have purchased this tranexamic acid. This is the time for you, you need to explore the uterus to find out, did I leave a cotyledon behind? Or if it is still difficult to explore the uterus and the placenta is still available, this is the time to look at it, to find out whether it was complete and all the products have been delivered. We'll have a special session on carboprost, but it's now part of the guideline. And carboprost has specific advantages over oxytocin. I'm, no, I'm sure you're not to need complaints like this batch of oxytocin that we received is probably not working well. So the oxytocin had a lot of challenges with storage. Uh, not many facilities could maintain the cold chain. And carboprost has come and it's going to save us from a lot of these challenges of storage. And then egometrin. As the Agra said, it is making a comeback on the, on the guideline on the market. So after identifying the cause, and if you can proceed to treat the atone with oxytocin, as we have said, by manual compression, uterine balloon tamponade, or the anti-shock garment that we are watching uh, during the break. Blood transfusion is key. Referral if the bleeding continues. People exhaustively discussed uh, referral things and how it is a challenge. So most times where we work in Mbali Hospital, it is hard to refer a patient. But there are times when we, want, we can't access the theater bed because it is one and there might be another patient that is being operated. So the interventions that are indicated in this, like by manual compression of the uterus, or balloon tamponade of the uterus are interventions that can be used as a bridge between medical management 
and surgical intervention to try and stop hemorrhage as you wait. The same in case your facility refers to a higher facility, sometimes you might have to do the bimanual compression as the patient is being transported to a facility where they will seek care. We have had experience with some, some partners where we do skills workshops for our new interns. And we have been teaching the B. Lynch suture. And it has saved a number of women from losing their uterus and also losing their life. So we think that this is, we know that this is one intervention, one skill that can be easily uh, attained by even the, med, the, the intern doctors. And when they start applying it, it saves many lives and it saves many women from losing their uteruses. So go back up here. The next big cause of uh, postpartum hemorrhage is tears and lacerations. And you'll agree with me that these arise from because our intrapartum care is inadequate. Women are delivering in the health facilities, but you really wonder whether they are getting skilled birth attendance because there is no way one midwife can reasonably oversee 10 or 15 women in labor. So tears and lacerations are inevitable and they need to be uh, repaired when they have been identified. So this means inspecting the genital tract to identify the tears is very important. You need adequate light. We know that maybe sometimes the light is not, is not ideal, but once you find a tear, grade it if it is in the perineum and decide whether you can repair it in theater or you can repair it immediately in the labor ward. If it is a cervical tear, the intervention is simple. We know that if you place a clamp at the tip of the tear, you will stop the hemorrhage. And sometimes that's all that is needed to save the life. And then, of course, this includes ruptured uterus, tears. We should not forget that. And these arise because obstructed labor is very common. The other third major cause of uh, primary postpartum hemorrhage that we are looking at here is retained tissues, most cases the placenta, or a piece of the membranes, or a cotyledon. If you identify that it has remained inside, or the, the uterus, is the placenta is still in, please do manual removal of the placenta. If there are products that you've identified and they are small enough, they can be easily removed by manual vacuum aspiration, MVA. So it is important to also promote skills for manual vacuum aspiration of the uterus. And as we mentioned earlier, as you had discussed earlier, it is important that these interventions are timely so that you do not move from a point where you need uh, fresh frozen plasma or you need fresh blood as a result of uh, a DIC. Yes, let's go to another slide. Yes, this is where we are next. Secondary PPH. Secondary PPH, you know, by definition, this is what occurs 24 hours after childbirth, but within the six weeks postpartum. And the predisposing factors are usually retained products, sepsis, or trauma. I think there's a time, if, I, if my memory serves me well, we found a patient with secondary PPH, but the cause was a ruptured uterus. These previous scars that push from home two weeks later. And she presented with the secondary PPH, sepsis, 
And when we explored further, we found that it was actually a uterus that had ruptured. And we found a tear along the lower segment. So this is also a common cause of uh, hemorrhage. The other thing is uh, about secondary PPH is keeping in mind gestational trophoblastic disease, especially if you are at a site that receives referrals, especially if you listen to a story and this patient has been evacuated many, many, many times. Always think about this gestational trophoblastic disease. Some patients with, prime, with secondary PPH will come when they are in a collapsed state, and that takes back to our first band of care. What is the condition of the patient? And we need to identify whether they are in shock or they are not in shock so that we can stabilize them. And that includes setting up IV access. You remember our fluids of choice were one, Ringer's lactate, where Ringer's lactate is not available, no more saline. Our oxytocic agents, tranexamic acid, and being able to do blood workup, a CBC, blood group, and a coagulation profile. If you have access to the blood, please transfuse. And the best blood that you can have is fresh blood in case you have a way of finding it. Because fresh blood still has the platelets. I think the platelets are the first ones to die off in the blood. I don't know in how many hours or days we need to visit Guyton. Then the clotting factors. So the fresher the blood, the better. And then, of course, we have said that sepsis is a common thing. Please, antibiotics. I think sometimes the secondary sepsis and secondary PPH is a bit forgiving because each clinic a patient goes to, they will receive some safety reaction. So many of them don't come with a lot of <laughs> septic shock. So a very bad thing, usually there is a silver lining somewhere. So if the patient is uh, stable or you think that you have stabilized them, an ultrasound is important. One of the weaknesses we have as the people who work in maternities, we have very limited ultrasound skills. But I think the trends are changing and we need to improve. Because as you've realized, sometimes you ask for an ultrasound and the person tells you nothing, yet the patient has spent maybe 30,000 or 40,000. If you had your own simple scan, you could probably see many of these things and be able to intervene quickly. Sometimes when you do that, you might find that the problem here is actually retained products. So if you find that there are retained products, digital and MVA or sponge holding forceps for evacuating the uterus will work. Thank you. If there are no retained products that you can see easily or that you can feel easily in the os, and this bleeding is still unexplained, please, there's room to explore the gentle tract under some form of analgesia, examination or under general anesthesia or examination under sedation. That's when you'll be able to identify things like vaginal tears or a ruptured uterus or poorly repaired cesarean section incision. And those will necessitate that you go to theater. If all these things you've done them and they, you're not arriving at something, please do a beta HCG. It might have the answer to what is puzzling you. Let's go to the next slide. This is what we've done, the next one. 
uh, 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 this next slide is talking about uh, preparedness, what we talked about. I wonder what the experience is with, uh, with other people. So one time in Mbale, we said PPH is a more common cause of uh, uh, deaths here. Let's come up with an, a PPH box. And we got some support. We went and made some red boxes and put things that you would need to manage PPH. So we put the gray cannulas. We put a condom for a condom catheter because we didn't have the buckle balloons. We put a foley catheter, some drugs. And after like uh, managing the first or two patients, even the boxes disappeared. <laughs> so the problem was sustaining that good practice. I wonder what the rest <laughs> have experienced. So sometimes the PPH cabinet is nicely put there, labeled, but getting the kit open it, the in charge has gone with the key. So our problem was replacing the things in the box. I said, ah, but we don't have supplies. So why should we keep these supplies in this box waiting for PPH? When So it's good practice, but it is something that we need to see how we sustain to go forward. And this is putting the things that we need to do in a nutshell. So in case you want to come up with a PPH box, this is what you need in that PPH box. This is what is shown here on this slide. And the box on the, on the right is telling us, this is what we reviewed earlier, that you need to call for help. And we are proposing that ring a bell. I think these bells in the bookshop are 50,000. RBF can buy like five. So that it, as people carry it out, we keep replacing it. You need to assess, as we said, that now we are trying to emphasize the point of saying, don't just depend on the amount of blood lost. Because we know that sometimes primary PPH can arise as a result of dramatic blood loss, fast flowing blood, or sometimes it's a slow oozing. So let the condition of the patient be the guiding principle. What is the blood pressure? What is the pulse? What is the level of consciousness of the patient? Sometimes you put your cannula and the patient is struggling and removing all your cannulas and we are very mad that the patient is uncooperative. It might be that their level of consciousness is actually doing what? De dropping. Emptying the bladder. I know that sometimes getting a, a foley catheter is difficult, but there are many things that you can use to simply empty the bladder. Rubbing the uterus to make sure that it remains contracted. And this is something we need to show our patients, each and every patient that has delivered as the third cardinal step to keep filling the uterus in the abdomen. Uh, setting up two large IV cannula. Please, let's not wait until the patient has developed PPH. So in the guideline for safe birth, safe deliver and safe birth, once the mother gets into second stage, they want us, each mother, to have a cannula on it, IV access, because we anticipate this. Have blood grouped and cross-matched. Ideally, each patient should have blood grouping and cross-matched done as they are in labor. It would be interesting to find out how many people adhere to this quality improvement standard. How many patients that come for delivery have blood cross-matched and booked. Active management of third stage of labor, very important. We have seen that we know that it can reduce up to 80% of the cases of PPH that arise from uterine atone. So oxytocin are very important. Oxytocin being number one, now there's cabetocin that is better than oxytocin. And then there is misoprostol, and uh, egometrin, as we've seen. Tranexamic acid should be used in all cases of postpartum hemorrhage. Delivering the placenta by controlled cord traction, especially if it is not delivered 
uh, before that. And then identify the 40s of primary postpartum hemorrhage, knowing that uterine atom is number one, tears, then retained tissues, and finally, the bleeding disorders. Colleagues, I beg to end here, and uh, we have a discussion on this and additions as we proceed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Milton, for that presentation on uh, PPH management. So do we have any questions at this moment? Additions, no subtractions. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Milton. I don't know if Dr. Onunga is still on, on the call. We are talking about bando. I'm bando here. what? Okay. I'm here. I don't know my fellow colleagues and senior colleagues. There's this uh, vitamin K. I am vitamin K. Do you also often use it? Is do you think can okay also since you're talking about bando, bando, band of care? In case you are waiting for tranexamic acid, is it? I don't know. Could it also include it in the band of care? That band of care. I don't know. I want to get some. Okay, Doctor Milton will be able to answer that. Doctor Kruby. Thank you, Tim. Uh, very nice presentation, Doctor Milton. Um, issues. Uh, the bundles seem to be okay. Um, where is the role of uh, hemostats during uh, operative management? Do we have a role of Sagisil if you reach an area where the bleeding is from everywhere? Do we have a role for Sagisil? And if so, is it a commodity that will be uh, included? I believe you've come to a situation where you have to use mops and packs to get out so that you allow time for the mother to clot as you give uh, the other products. So is it something we are thinking about? Secondary, uh, on the oxytocin, I don't know why we insisted on 20 international units in a liter, yet our commodities are supplied in 500 mils. So I want to guide my midwife. How will I tell her to give this oxytocin 20 international units in a liter? yet her commodity comes in 500 mils. Is it 10 per, and therefore in what time period? We have to be specific because these are the people going to implement uh, the strategies. The third thing, if you've looked at oddities from lower facilities, you hinted on it, the mother becomes uncooperative. Unfortunately, we have ruptures where you don't have a lot of bleeding to see. And in the uncooperative mother, even BP becomes hard to take. Everything is thrown away. Since this is something you see in most audits, especially in lower facilities, have you considered including it that if a mother was previously okay after birth, She's uncooperative. Think it is severe PPH, concealed somewhere. I'm talking from experience. I've seen a mother die. And just before I was called in, the only thing was that the mother who delivered about three hours ago is very uncooperative, throwing everything everywhere. So vitals were down and uncooperative, but there was no obvious bleeding. So it was a rupture into the broad ligament. So have we thought of this thing that is being reported in most audits? 
how we can incorporate it into uh, a sign to identify severe PPH, even if there is no obvious uh, genital tract bleeding. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Milton. I have two questions. One, uh, you say that we discourage rectal misoprostol. Uh, however, in the facility I work, we mostly use GA. Uh, how do I help such a, a, a patient in case I have the misoprostol, but I cannot give it sublingo? Uh, secondly, uh, oxytocin. Is it that I cannot go beyond 20 international units or I can go beyond and to what level? Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just wondering if we have any online questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Milton, for that wonderful presentation. My comment is about the um, IV access. We realize that in a number of our health facilities, uh, mothers go through labor and delivery without any IV access. Now that we are moving to use of IV oxytocin in the arm still, how are we going to emphasize that every mother who is admitted in labor has an IV line? And I relate this to the last maternal death we had in our hospital. A mother was referred, a 16 year old was referred from one of the peripheral facilities. And the reason for referral was PPH, but they had failed to access um, an IV line. So is it possible to emphasize that every mother who is admitted in labor should have an IV line instead of us waiting for second stage where a mother has already become uncooperative, you have only probably one midwife uh, taking care of a number of mothers yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doctor. Dr. Milton, should we take all of them or you first answer those, then we come back to them? Oh, the answers are within us. Yes, yes, exactly. So some answers are here within. Actually, I was seeing people as they were asking, someone was nodding their head saying, it is me answering that one. So the answers are within us here. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's asking. I want to share. Oh, okay. Before. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Newton, for that presentation. One of the things is about oxytocin. This item, in terms of storage in most facilities, is really very bad. Most facilities, they are improvising ice packs, which sometimes they made like three weeks ago and the people are still putting oxytocin there. I think we need to come up with a policy that now there is RBF because we are the custodians who use this item, that every facility should have at least a small fridge in the labor, so even at Helive Center 3, that this item needs to be taken care of very well since it requires a certain temperature. Then from the, the protocol, the guideline, the additional commodity available here is carboprost of about 125 milligrams, but there is the heat stable carbetosin. I don't know whether plans are underway, if we, maybe Dr. Nong is still online, whether plans are underway that to include it on the essential medicines list of Uganda about the heat stable carbetosin, since it looks to be superior or we shall be getting it on private market. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I think oxytocin, you can give more doses, but you should not exceed more than 80 milligrams in 24 hours. Yes, eight international units, not milligrams in 24 hours. <laughs> in one liter, I think we see. Yes. 
Yes, exactly. Even me, if I got this, I would give it 10 international units in 500 mils. And this will be two bottles required. It will take one one, and that will make up one liter. But this technical aspect is for how long do you give this, the duration? That's one of the questions. Dr. Ankaru, was it? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. The what? Yes. Yeah, of course, vitamin K, we don't have data to support the use of vitamin K uh, in our, uh, uh, what we are discussing, the prevention of PPH. What I know is that we give it for the newborns. Uh, then uh, hemostats, I've seen them being used uh, where you have uh, oozing that is, um, um, that is uh, all over the surface, especially when you, when you have, um, um, when, you, when, when you've done a, a hysterectomy and the whole of the, uh, the porch of that glass and that kind of thing, you have a lot of oozing. I've seen uh, hemostats like mops being put uh, in, 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 uh, in, on, on the site, and then the following day they come back to, to remove the, the mop. Uh, for the IV line, like in Imbale, it's, uh, we have a soap whereby every mother who is admitted into labor ward must be, uh, they must insert an IV line. And uh, we, we, we are doing this on the assumption that we are admitting these mothers into labor ward when they're in active phase of labor. Because we also don't want to leave the, uh, the IV line for two days, three days when the mother is still in maybe latent labor or something like that. So uh, it's a good practice. The other practice uh, that is good also is uh, the issue of monitoring immediately after delivery. Uh, in, in, in Imbale, one of the standard operating procedures is that once a mother has been done a steroid section, uh, they are left in, 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 in a corner in theater for a period of one hour. And within that one hour, every 15 minutes, uh, the midwife takes the vitals and then checks the bleeding. Yeah. And uh, after that one hour elapses, then they invite the postnatal midwife who comes to receive the mother. And one of the things that postnatal midwife checks are those parameters, have they been taken? She does not accept to receive the patient unless she sees all those four, parameter, uh, four times of taking the vital signs and they are stable. If she, she identifies they are taken and they're not stable, then she alerts the team. Uh, Milton, anything else? Okay, this is a very nice discussion around management of PPH, right? Uh, thank you very much for the submissions. I have something to say about the oxytocin. Uh, uh, we can go up to about 70 IUs, but beyond 40 IU, uh, international units, you risk the other side effects of oxytocin, the hypotension and what comes along with. So we agreed in the guidelines not to go beyond 40. Beyond that, we need to be very conscious. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Nonge. Hello. I was not hearing properly from Dr. Milton. The question to me. Uh, Dr. Nunge, we thought you had a supplement. It's not okay. really a question okay. directed okay. to you. Okay. I'm well, wondering I, whether you had a supplement. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Milton, for taking us through uh, a treatment of PPH. And what you mentioned about... Hello, you're hearing me? Yes. The emergency kit. Hmm? Uh, having it ready at all times. I believe we need to institute or have a focal person like the in charge who checks 
every every day that how is the emergency kit is everything in place and also delegating it maybe to another person who will be checking so that uh, it doesn't remain as everyone's business so it it ensures that there is somebody accountable and two is that she if you have the emergency kit, can it be sealed that is not accessible to anyone? It's actually accessed when there is a PPH. Have you, have, you have seen those zip locks. Hmm? If it can be having a zip lock that you only break it when there's a PPH, but if it is open and anyone can access, you find one person has picked a catheter, another person has picked the, uh, the gloves, and you end up with the, in no kit at all. But this is what Commissioner was emphasizing that. Uh, we need to have an attitude of emergency preparedness across all facilities. So this is one of the things I think as quality improvement, we need basically to have. Uh, vitamin K, uh, Mr. Abubakar Nakendo, is, you know, for you to have vitamin K stopping bleeding, it has to go through the manufacture of clotting factors in the liver, but we have a PPH. How long will it take to manufacture those factors? So there's no room for vitamin K to be used and the evidence there is do not use it for treating PPH. If you are using it, you are just treating yourself. You are not treating the, what, the, the patient. I like the suggestion of using the hemostat. That is usually in very severe traumatic PPH or when you are doing a TAH and you have those bleeders, you cannot put a, a stitch you can put a surge seal, but I don't think we shall have it in, in every facility. It's only maybe a few regional referral hospitals who can have it, but lower down may be very expensive for, for the government to advocate for it to be purchased. Uh, the other, now, the uncooperative mother, what people need to know that that uncooperation is due to hypoxia. And if we can do mentoring and telling people like this mother who came and was mentioned as uncooperative and died, can we involve those people from low down to say that when she started becoming an uncooperative because she was hypovolemic and two, she was hypoxic. The hypoxia makes everyone restless and that should be instilled on every person. It is not in the guidelines, but it's something which can be put, I don't know how. I don't know how do we reach every every woman or every healthy worker who is in the facility to tell them that the moment you see somebody in cooperative, make sure this person is either receiving some oxygen or IV fluid because their brain is not receiving oxygen. That's why she's behaving in that way. Speak to these people, speak to every health worker, then you could be able to achieve that. In very good working places, it is usually practiced just like in Mbali that every mother who enters into labor ward receives an IV access. We don't wait for a PPH to happen. That IV access also accepts, it allows you to take off blood for HB estimation. So the time you need an IV access line, you, it is already available. And the, you don't need to struggle with this patient, which is the blood vessels have already collapsed. So can we practice that? If the facilities are available with the cannulas, can we do it? Uh, now, the giving of oxytocin for active management in third stage of labor is both IV and IM. I think our guidelines still uh, for prevention, we still take the IM one. It is on treatment. That's when we need the IV access because we want the oxytocin to reach uh, to the uterus as fast as possible. But we still use the IM for, for, for basically prevention. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, who, the heat stable capitalism is included in the guidelines. It is available already in the guidelines was working very hard to make sure that it is included in the essential maternal and newborn care guidelines which are being reviewed currently and the, 
it is one maybe changer as the, the presentation which is coming that it is something which can be used in lower facilities which do not have uh, uh, refrigeration. Meanwhile, carboprost is different from heat stable carbotocin. Carboprost is 250 micrograms. I think there's a, a, a bit of amendment in that uh, protocol which was uh, shared. It is a prostaglandin. It is really used in cases which have failed to respond to the other or hydrotonics. Uh, we we'll bring back egometrin to be used in fewer areas. We think that for every one un 10 units of oxytocin, we should request for one unit of oxytocin, specifically for treatment. They are where oxytocin has failed, egometrin has saved us. So in your facility, you need to have it, but also ensure that it's stored in a, a dark place and then in under refrigeration for you to get good results. I think that is over. The questions which I pick, the comments I could add to. Thank you so much, Dr. Ononge, but we still have some questions for you. Please stay online. Uh, but at this moment, I've been told that our guest of honor is online. So I take this opportunity to give the microphone to my to the senior chair so that he's able to invite the guest of honor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Hadija. So once again, I take this opportunity to welcome the assistant commissioner in charge of reproductive and, uh, and infant health, Dr. Mugahi. Maybe something to say is that uh, I think is uh, the most active um, uh, government official to me as for now is someone you can even WhatsApp at midnight and you'll get a response if it's true with the patient care and uh, health. So I take this opportunity, Dr. Mugahi, to welcome you to talk to the team, please. Unmute and uh, talk to us. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Chair, Dr. Bameke. I think that's the right pronunciation, right? <coughs> it's Bameka. 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 Uh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bameka. And uh, thank you so much, Team um, uh, Mbale, Team Elgon. I think you refer yourselves to as Team Elgon. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited uh, by the fact that this meeting is happening. Um, I did tune in in the morning and I found when you were presenting, so I, I rushed for a quick engagement with the PS. Uh, but all in all, I'm happy to be here again and make some remarks. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I'm one person who doesn't like titles. I just want to prefer to address you as colleagues uh, um, because I understand what you go through day to day to deliver uh, critical services to our mothers and the newborn. And I'm really happy and I, we appreciate the work that you do. And thank you for hosting us on Saturday as the Elgon Group, Mbale uh, 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 region. We really appreciate. Uh, in a special way, I want to want to thank Dr. Bameka uh, for putting together this important uh, meeting. Uh, actually, early this morning, I also had another meeting from Bositema, uh, a journal club that I attended. And um, and uh, for the record, my my phone can always be available for any help. Uh, if I don't pick instantly, please send me a WhatsApp or a text message. I should be able to respond to you or follow up issues that are very complicated for you. Um, I want to put off the video because of the network, uh, but uh, I'll remain on, uh, on the audio. Uh, friends, I've not listened in so much into your presentations because of that other meeting, but uh, uh, I want to appreciate Aogu. I want to appreciate Aogu uh, and uh, the chairperson of the uh, NASMEC, uh, subcommittee for PPH, Dr. Sam Ononge, 
and your entire team naka naka today naka kad i forgotten the name she will forgive me she's my very good friend but uh, uh, the private midwives for mobilizing the entire country to make sure that this dissemination of the uh, PPH activity framework or intervention framework is happening. Our colleagues, we have lost mothers, but we've not only lost mothers, but we have lost sisters. The numbers we've been counting are not only numbers. They are either someone's mother, uh, someone's sister, someone's wife, and, and someone's relative. Uh, so we, 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 when we talk about PPH climbing 40%, PPH climbing 40% uh, of all the maternal deaths in this country, then we are talking about a huge number. Last year, we counted, we got to around 1,300 1, maternal deaths. These are institutional. And 40% of this, almost a half, is PPH, 1,300 maternal death last year, institutional, meaning that if you went off institutional, we could probably have made 1,600. But we want to thank you. This is a reduction. This is a, a smaller number compared to that of last year. Um, last year, uh, last financial year, we had 99 per 100,000. You can write that, 99 per 100,000 deliveries were maternal deaths last year but one. Now, the last year, uh, which we can say is 2021, 2021-2022, <clears throat> 2021-2022, um, we have 92 per 100,000 deliveries, institutional maternal death. So a drop, a drop of, uh, of seven from 99 to, uh, uh, actually the other one was 100, it was 99.5, that's 100 from 100 to 92, a drop of eight maternal death. You're doing a great job, but we can do more. We can do more. Uh, as Minister of Health, we want to single out, with your help, with your support, to attack this monster, uh, one number one monster for mothers, which is PPH. Number one killer, number one monster for maternal death, which is PPH. If we reduced, from 40% to 20% within this year. That's a huge impact, huge impact. That means we'll have saved probably 300 plus mothers. So those numbers you already have, uh, we know what magnitude, how big the burden is. We actually know how big the burden is, even in Elgon sub-region, uh, Orumbale, uh, we are able to quantify. And the issues leading to maternal death and there is one cause that probably has not been mentioned, uh, one or two that I would like to mention in this meeting, because I've been part of these reviews that happen every Monday and every Friday. Uh, there is, uh, I want to use a classic example of a health facility in, in, uh, in Imbale catchment area. Uh, uh, I'll not mention the facility where the midwife the midwife kept one previous car at a lower health facility, a health center three, and kept encouraging the mother. And this was a fresh previous car. Kept encouraging the mother to push, push, push until the mother ruptured. Upon seeing the mother had ruptured and uh, got an altered mentation, the mother was uh, uh, forwarded or referred to a health center four. Unfortunately, she did not make it to a health center four. She died on arrival. So these are issues. These are issues. Uh, uh, I think some of you might be knowing this midwife. Uh, so the cause here was actually failure to, 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 to make the correct decision. A fresh scar, one previous scar, having obstructed labor, you're giving a trial of labor in a facility without CMOC facilities. Chair, I want you as a team to reflect so much on this so that our, as you go out to do support supervision, as the ADHOs do support supervision, as the seniors do support supervision, you can emphasize that there is absolutely no indication for a midwife at a health center three to handle a fresh previous car. 
these must be referred to a CMOC site that is able uh, uh, to give a trial of labor, but with facilities to do uh, an emergency cesarean section. Uh, the, second, the second point that I thought probably uh, is not academic. You'll not find this in textbooks. We are losing mothers and the cause of death is PPH. The cause of death, according to the certificate, is PPH. But when you have an internal reflection, and until we begin talking about these issues, you ultimately see that this cause is poor monitoring, poor monitoring of labor. And when you have poor monitoring of labor, then you'll have a poor decision because we have not monitored using a pathograph. We have not clearly seen where we need to make a decision. And this directly feeds into, so the cause of death, as we review, will be postpartum hemorrhage. We shall all mention postpartum hemorrhage, but the cause actually is poor monitoring of labor using uh, standard uh, 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 methods of using a pathograph. So colleagues, as we embark on this, I want to hear that Mbale subregion or, or Elgon subregion is one of the regions where midwives are actively monitoring mothers, actively monitoring labor using a pathograph. And that's a very systematic way. And that's an SOP, which we must enforce, which we must ensure that it's happening. We introduced RBF, but some of these uh, uh, pathographs are just forging. So this will help our midwives to when to make a decision, really, if they can use that very well. And lastly, intra-facilitated delays, intra-facilitated delays, uh, uh, lack of personnel, lack of personnel. There is something that I'm sure has not been talked about. It's called uh, uh, organized absenteeism. Organized absenteeism. They leave fewer staff on duty and other staff are away. Now I'm now speaking as a manager, but we need to have a reflection as a, as a team, uh, as healthcare workers. Uh, on Monday this week, we had a review with uh, uh, the team from Yumbe. One midwife cannot manage to be in labor suit and also be in theater at the same time, and also monitor a post-op case. This is practically impossible. Colleagues, we need, the doctors need to take uh, extra responsibility of also reviewing post-op mothers. In some of these hospitals, we lose almost 30% of post-op mothers. 30%. And, 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 and we come in and because the monitoring post-op is quite not good. Uh, by and large, I know when we listen to these non-traditional causes of maternal death, as I mentioned, number one, uh, I want to paraphrase and end my submission. Number one is uh, uh, organized absenteeism. Absenteeism. Organized absenteeism leads to thin, uh, a thin health workforce on ground to handle all the critical areas. Uh, I gave an example, a midwife cannot be in theater, be also in labor suite and also monitor your post or post op will not be monitored. I had an interface with this when I was still serving as a DHO. A doctor of operation left the mother in a, the post-op ward and the mother bled to death. The midwife only came after two hours to realize the mother was gasping for life. So we can reduce these are preventable death. Number two is the issue of intra-facilitated delays. There's no lab person, there's no store person, there's no what. Until these modifiable issues are looked in. I'm not saying that they are everywhere, but until these modifiable issues are looked in, then we still have a challenge. We reviewed another case here from a hospital. The hospital, the problem was actually the hospital lab that was not available. The blood bank had enough blood. The hospital lab was not requesting for enough blood. And that, that's a paradox. The blood bank says, I have enough blood. The hospital lab does not request for enough blood and the, the, the ward ends up not having enough blood. That's a paradox, and you need to fix it. It was one time reported in Imbali. Um, um, the last one, as I mentioned, is the issue of, uh, of, uh, of supporting uh, 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 doctor of absenteeism, the issue of having 
uh, quality improvement systems and performance review to see how we are making progress and also reviewing some near misses and we learn from them. So uh, with those remarks, I want to thank the organizers uh, of this important meeting. I'm sure you're all uh, warming up for lunch. And I want to thank the sponsors of this, AOGU and, uh, and uh, the Private Midwives Association. Uh, uh, thank you so much for making this come out. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Samuel Nonge talked about the, the, uh, the, uh, the gown. Um, uh, the, uh, um, this thing for, for, for organ mobilizing blood to the vital organs. Dr. Sam, the name has gone. Um, the gamut, the gamut. It's called the gamut. Uh, non pneumatic and shock gamut, I think, something like yeah. that. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, and uh, we have enough of them in store. Dan, Dr. Dan Morocco, if you're around, if any facility needs them, please uh, kindly uh, support them. Um, and then we, we are also looking at any other possible, he has talked about the heat stable capetosin uh, uh, in hot areas. I think this is very handy. Uh, we, we are working very closely with the, 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 uh, with the emergency medical department headed by your very own Dr. Wanyai. And we think that we shall be able to, to have a very good understanding so that referrals are carried to the health facilities on time. And the critical supplies are also available in the health facilities. So I want to thank you, Chair, uh, for that wonderful, for this wonderful opportunity. I want to thank the, the, the participants for sparing time to come and attend this in very important uh, uh, meeting. Um, there is an ongoing maternal newborn health quality of care meeting in Kampala. We shared the link. That's the reason we are not having our meeting tomorrow. And uh, I also want to implore you, those who are doing research, that in the last week of October, we have the Safe Motherhood. It has been earmarked by Minister of Health as the Safe Motherhood Week. So we shall be again in Kampala. We shall invite some of you to come to Kampala and make presentations. So whatever you're doing, please document, uh, uh, make uh, information available for sharing. And uh, last week of October is our Safe Motherhood uh, Conference. It has family planning, everything about Safe Motherhood is in there. So uh, I want to thank you once again, Chair, for this opportunity. And also re-emphasize my availability to help, my availability to help. Uh, 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 some of the modifiable factors where you think we can actually help. Uh, thank you so much. Over to you, Chair. I'm available for any questions. Uh, uh, I have some extra time on me and I'll be listening in. Thank you so much. Over to you, Chair. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Dr. Mugahi, for the wonderful submission. Uh, any questions for the Assistant Commissioner? Yes, Dr. Susan. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Mugahi, for your presentation. Um, mine is not a question as such, but it's an appeal to the government of Uganda through the Ministry of Health. Uh, we are all struggling to save mothers from dying following postpartum hemorrhage or any obstetric emergencies. But we are facing a challenge, especially those of us working at the lower health facilities. Uh, the commodities that are being supplied cannot run even two weeks in a busy center. Take for example, in Kamuli district, we haven't received ketamine for the past six months. And it's a life-saving life drug for emergency obstetric care. And we all know that it's not sold commonly in drug shops or pharmacies. So how are we going to improve this in the near future or in the next financial year? Then the pitocin that is received is also not adequate. Yes, we thank God for the RBF and PHC funds, but in the event that we do not have enough and the facilities cannot buy or procure enough pitocin, these mothers are going to drug shops to buy pitocin that is not uh, properly 
uh, saved or stored at the cold chain that is required. And you keep using it and it's not working. So it is my humble appeal that these essential drugs are supplied in adequate quantities, pitocin, misoprostol, and also to include transamic acid as one of the essential drug list, at least for district health, district hospitals, not only for regional and national referrals. Thank you. I think let's take all the questions, then Dr. Mgai will answer at once. Thank you very much, Dr. Mugak, for your presentation. Since now we are saying that we need an IV access for mothers who are in towards second stage, can we make sure that the, the IV cannulas are part of the mama kit? Thank you, Professor. Yes, doc. uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, my comment is on RBF. First of all, I want to thank the ministry for that innovation. However, uh, the challenge we are having some of us is that the funds come very late and that one affects planning for them. And even when they are coming, I think uh, the in are not aware. They only wake up and they find maybe there is money and maybe it takes another two, three quarters without coming. So. My appeal is that if this money could be uh, coming gradually, it could be helping us as far as maternal health is concerned. Any other? Yeah, Dr. Mugabe. Yes, I, I would like to appreciate uh, Dr. Richard Mugahi for the <clears throat> presentation. Uh, I would also want to bring to your attention of another good practice that we have in the Elgon region, as far as commodities are concerned. Uh, on, on, on Saturday, uh, one, of the, uh, one person from another region approached me and then was asking how uh, the region and, uh, and the lower facilities are able to harmoniously work. They had observed me and the DHO and the like moving around smoothly. And uh, one thing I want to tell you is that in Elgon region, the flow of these uh, small, small commodities like oxytocin, magnesium sulfate, they can flow both from the regional fire hospital down to the lower facilities, and they can also flow backwards depending on the demand or, or, the, or the need. And uh, uh, that one can only happen if, if there is proper networking, good working relationship between the ADHOs and the region. So you, 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 can, you, can, you, you can create that kind of atmosphere where these things, uh, not only human resource in terms of supervision and maybe uh, these other uh, midwives coming to the, to the regional fire hospital for skills, but also the flow of commodities is very key. Why should a regional referral hospital lack like oxytocin when a nearby health center 304 has those which are expiring in the next one month and the, the, those commodities cannot come to the, to, to the regional referral hospital. So it's one of the good practice that we have uh, uh, that I think can be exploited. Thank you. Oh, that's a good one. Any other questions? I think we can have responses from the Assistant Commissioner. Dr. Mgahi, please. Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Um, um, I'll respond to questions according to the numbers because I didn't get the names, but at least I was able to see uh, the people who were asking. Um, I, 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 I want to begin with the comment on the good practice. Uh, I really, really appreciate the contribution from the gentleman who talked about the, the, the good practices. Uh, uh, colleagues, you'll all bear with me that our health system still has a number of challenges. But what we are trying to do, and our motivation is really to see 
how do we work within the available means to, to, to optimize, to make sure that we provide the best possible care. At some point, we can also look at, at, uh, at the issues and say, no, you have done your best. So I want to come down there and, and when I share with a colleague, like I've been, I visited Namatala Health Center for, in, is it Namatala? It must be Namatala, Niambale. Colleagues, I want to thank uh, the, 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 the in charge of Namatala in your presence. I visited Namatala and I think Professor Julius, you should consider giving them some uh, uh, doctors to rotate their junior doctors from the uni, uh, university who are rotating. It is such a high volume facility. On, on Saturday before I left for Kampala, I visited Namatala. I found their doctor must be Katie. And I moved around, amazing, amazing work going on. More than 50 Sicilian sections a month, more than close to 200 deliveries a month in a very short, small space. Uh, um, I would think this is really, really a demonstration. We know the quality of care is, uh, is might not have the enough space to do everything they need. But I want to thank the team there for utilizing, because all these numbers would find themselves in the regional referral and would have lower cases but taking off 200 normal deliveries and 50 cesarean sections is a massive achievement. Uh, those of you who have not visited, please I implore you to visit. It's very close within the vicinity of Mbale, but they are doing great work. So as a way of sharing good practice, if they are doing this much work, why can't we mobilize for them IV fluids from the lower facilities that are having excesses? I told you I've been DHOs. Most of this, there is now an official redistribution strategy acceptable and it's signed by someone in the DHT. If you realize an in charge in, let me say, and if it can even go in inter-district, it can be inter-facility or inter-district. I'm on the group of Renzori, a district had excess amoxicillin and it is distributing, it is distributing to the entire region. We don't want to hear expiries when there is starvation in other districts. So I wanted to make my entry point uh, uh, of redistribution. There is a strategy. Don't do it on your own because there's this group of health monitoring unit. They will disturb you in a way. But the redistribution, the forms are so easy to use. So easy to use, you can even do it retrospectively, but ensure that all the facilities, we optimize the little supplies that we have. Uh, um, and I really want to thank uh, you for, for, for bringing this up. And uh, I implore you that you use the system that's available to ensure that we benefit from this. Uh, the other comment came about uh, results-based financing. Um, there, there are still challenges. This is the first time we are using the results-based financing as a country. And uh, we have been growing from strength to strength, but the delays are really an issue. We've had this issue from day one. Uh, delays, delays, delays. But some of the delays are coming from the districts. Uh, I, I was discussing, or I sit on the National Steering Committee of this, of the, 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 the AMCHI project, and clear the delays are coming from uh, the districts because there is a requirement of having an audit report by the internal auditor. This was picked out as the major issue for most districts that were getting delays. The internal audit of Mbale, if it's Mbale, needs to have a look at your documentation and paperwork. And uh, initially, I think there was a problem of facilitating them, but that has been since been sorted. So I will forward escalate this issue, but it's an old issue, uh, so that we, we reduce on the lead time for people to get money. But if, let me say, like Tororo, I don't know if Tororo is here, uh, uh, the ADH of Tororo, uh, Connie, uh, Tororo Hospital had a challenge. All the other districts received their money and Tororo Hospital did not receive their money. So what Sister Konye did was to call me directly. And I appreciate that. If you call me with a challenge like that and say, how come Bulambuli has received their money? Serongo has got their money. For us, we've never gotten our money. Please don't hesitate immediately after this meeting, during your lunch break, call me. Call me if it's an isolated problem. The others have received their RBF money and you have not received your money. You do not need to get transport and come to Kampala. I will do that on your behalf. I have done it for Tororo. Uh, if Sister Kony is in this, in this forum, she can testify. Tororo Hospital had not received their money. They needed to buy a sterilizer. They were referring all cases to Mbale. 
And I followed up the money within a week. Their money was out within a week. So I requested for how to resubmit the account through me, and I got the money within uh, a week or two. So that one we can do. We can do. Um, the other delays, I will escalate this to another uh, uh, office who is in charge. But you also have the Arabia focal person for Elgon. If you have an issue, you push it to me, I'll push it to them, and immediately we shall get an answer. I trust me, our lead time is three days maximum. We must have an action done. I'll put them under pressure because I love working under pressure. Um, the other comment came from Professor Julius. I think this is a very nice submission. Professor Julius, my friend and, 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 and mentor, uh, I really appreciate this, but we need um, uh, 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 a cannula as part of the mama kit. And, uh, and I think for sharing purposes, we are also working out a cesarean section kit. I don't know if anyone had told you about this. Uh, we, we, the, the, we are, it has already been piloted in some facilities they are actually using uh, 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 Dr. Samo Nonga, you could talk more about this. I know Kawemp is using uh, cesarean section kits and all these requirements, all these uh, components are part of the cesarean section kit. But I take it seriously. I will discuss with the colleagues from the National Medical Store. Uh, uh, until recently, I've been a member of the National Medical Stores Board. So I, I have very good friends there. And, uh, and, and this leads me to the question number one raised by my, my old friend, uh, the doctor in Kamuli. I've been to Kamuli, I've not seen you. Liagoba, Liagoba, we, we, we discussed on Saturday at DHO. You never told me that Kamuli, there is no ketamine. To me, the first greeting should be there is no ketamine in Kamuli, if you happen to see me anywhere. So, so I think this is a very serious, very serious actually, that you can go for six months without ketamine. Uh, I take it seriously and I'm going to follow up. I'll give you an answer within the next two hours uh, because I really think it is serious. But for you to sit on a problem for six months, you write discrepancy reports, they don't bring. You, 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 you try to call, they don't do anything. And, and I've been to Kamuli a couple of times. This was also, um, uh, try to do your part of following up and, and kindly follow me up in the next two hours, I should have an answer of why Kamuli is not having ketamine for six months. And I also get worried why a general hospital that is on a pool system, where you order for yourselves. Because Kamuli, you are not on a push system. You order for what you want. You are allocated money and you order. Why you are not able to have uh, 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 a drug that you order. And if you have any certificate of non-availability, please let us know so that we can advise you accordingly. Uh, a DHO Kamuli, you have a new DHO, brand new, uh, uh, Dr. Wako. Uh, things must be better. You even have more support coming through Koika. Uh, we should be performing better uh, uh, with the support that we have. Uh, and uh, you did mention about Pitocin, also not enough. Um, we, we under the arrangement of having uh, a kit, I think we should be able to, to, to see how we can, we can even, uh, um, uh, as we, we are looking for money for introduction of heat stable carbetocin, uh, this could also supplement the existing pitocin. We are not phasing out pitocin completely, but uh, for hospitals could easily have both uh, HSC and, 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 and pitocin at the same time. We are looking for funding for that. So I think those are the comments and questions that were posed to me. I once again want to thank you uh, for, 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 for listening to me. And, um, and if there's anyone who would like to clarify, especially this Kamuli issue, why, why you don't have ketamine, so that if I'm following up, I have better information. Yet, you are on a pool system. You, we, don't, we do not push drugs to you. Kamuli General Hospital is supposed to be pooling. Thank you so much. And over to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, as Sant Commissioner. Uh, I think we don't have any other questions for him. So I, I suggest that we go back to Dr. Nongi in our uh, question answer session. There was one, one thing that we, for which we wanted, yes, not yet presented. Yes, tranexamic acid and? 
And the doctor, doctor had the specific question about misoprostol. I would wish him to ask. Yes, let's uh, re echo the question so that we can get responses. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mugahi, for, 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 for the support and commitment towards my district. My other follow-up issue is, are there plans that are underway to include transemic acid as one of the essential drug lists for district hospitals? Straight away, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Uh, we, are, uh, we are revising the essential medicines list, the AML, and uh, I can guarantee tranexamic acid is one of the drugs that has already been, we've, we've done our submission as a, as a reproductive health department, and it's one of the drug or molecules that has been included. Uh, and hit stable capetosin, despite the fact that we, we, we have not yet gotten money to purchase it. But those key drugs have been included. And uh, Dr. Samuel Nonga is actually the one who made our submission. Thank you. Mugahi, another question for Dr. Nonge. Yeah, doctor, my clarification was on rectal misoprostol because it's discouraged, but in a case where I have a patient who is unconscious, maybe he has been operated under GA, can't I be able to put it in the rectum to help that patient? Dr. Nonge, please. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bameka. I first want to appreciate Commissioner for supporting uh, so many of us and uh, for his leadership. We appreciate you. And you had asked me to comment about, I will start with you first, about the Zeran section kit. Yes, National Medical Stores has a, a kit. I will share the details with the members here. It has a gown, two gowns, uh, the drapes, uh, sutures, enough of them. And then the gloves, uh, I think there are also the cord clamps. I will get the basically the broker which has all of them. So already Kawempe and the women hospital are requesting for it. And it's something which helps us to, to get ready as soon as possible. Because if you have a zero section, other than you complaining that you don't have a gown, you just need to open it and should be able to uh, perform perform the operation and this is all um, in preparedness for us to manage manage emergency zero section so please request for them if your budget allows and we should be able to set going now as regards uh, rectal mysoprostol yes it is true in situations where the mother is not able to swallow or you're fearing it when you put under the tongue she can easily aspirate you can use uh, rectal mysoprostol, but if the mother is conscious, sublingual works faster than the rectal mysoprostol if you want to control atony due to failure of the uterus, basically from various causes. So the preference is sublingual. However, in unconscious mother, you can put it rectal if other modalities are not available. But if you have oxytocin, oigometrine, and then carboprost, those should be able to give the IV in this unconscious mother. Uh, did I have another question? The EML already commission has mentioned, we made a submission and we pray that uh, it will be endorsed and uh, should be able to access it in public facilities, both drugs. Over to you, Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Nonge. We have one more question. Thank you very much, team. Uh, mine is on the, the control of miss of prostate use. We have also noticed that there are some lower facilities that use miso, miso prostate appropriate inappropriately. They give to mothers who are not supposed to receive them or they give them higher dosages. So most times you receive mothers with ruptured uteruses 
when, when they have received some high dosages of misoprostol. So do we have in plan some control, uh, do we have in plan some control system that will check law facilities or private facilities for this inappropriate use of misoprostol? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Court. Doctor. This man introduced, Dr. Nonga, maybe I can try to answer this. Uh, it was a concern that came up when you were uh, reviewing these guidelines and actually we've adopted misoprostol on a, for a number of uh, conditions with proper guidance on how it should be used. Not on the lower facilities, even at higher level facilities, people were misusing it. So that has been brought up and properly, there's proper guidance and we shall have proper training for all the cadres. Thank you. Maybe Dr. Nonge has something to add. He, now you have just hit it on, on the head. It is true that there is concern about uh, wrong doses used for induction. And the members who are reviewing the guidelines say, should we remove it for induction? We say, no, let's give the people the right doses. And if you look at the guidelines, it is clearly there, how much of misoprostol should you use for induction of labor? And these people should not use ignorance hmm, to give high doses. You're supposed to use very, very low doses if you want to induce uh, labor. And the, if you went higher, then you are going against the guidelines. So look at the guidelines. They should be able to guide us on how to use misoprostol for induction. Dr. Richard has his hand up, I think, maybe he has also. Yeah, just on, on the same issue of mesoprostol, Dr. Sam, um, uh, you remember we had very heated discussions on, on how mesoprostol, like the, the Dr. Court has mentioned, it has actually caused us more trouble uh, than the good that we had wanted to get from uh, uh, and mesoprostol. And this abuse is continuously it's growing, it's growing everywhere. Uh, what we have also noted is lack of observation, uh, uh, proper observation. And I did mention that observation was our very big gap. Uh, I want to give a very quick example of a mother who came in with a, a very um, a suspected preeclampsia uh, in one of our regional referrals and ended up dying because they did induce labor using mesoprostol ended dying of uh, a silent posterior rupture, PPH due to a, a silent posterior rupture. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, it all comes back to uh, maternal death cause that the, the, the non-traditional ones I mentioned. If you are going to give mesoprostol and you're not going to monitor, we are in trouble. So uh, 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 we, need, we need to have better monitoring systems uh, if we are going to continue using mesoprestol, uh, there was an issue of dosages that my, my friend, Dr. Samuel Nonga has clearly told us about. Uh, we want to see uh, probably um, uh, a poster reading mesoprestol, if not properly used, it can cause death, clearly like that, because people don't know that actually mesoprestol has caused death. We want to, to or we are still thinking what this may mean at the ministry, but mesoprestol, if not properly use it, we are using it as a, 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 a very good drug for induction and, and uh, PPH management, but if it's not properly used, then it can cause death. So I agree with you, but part of, part of this is continuous mentorship, uh, continuous supervision and guidance. We, we shall be able to share with you some of these learning examples that where mesoprostol has actually caused the more trouble. Thank you so much, Chair, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Mugahe. I think let's move on the, to the last presentation. One comment from another senior of men, Dr. Asen. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mugahe. You talked about um, uh, revising the essential drug list. And uh, for us in Bale, in Bale region, we usually have shortage of uh, blood and blood products. But uh, for most of our mothers, we, where we have failed to find blood or blood, other blood products, we've given them um, IVI and sucrose and we have had good results. I'm wondering whether IVI and sucrose can also be added in the essential drug list. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Thank you. Maybe Dr. Onongi or Dr. Mugahi can react to that. If, if IV iron sucrose can be added to the uh, national drug list, essential drug list. Yes. It's a, oh, no, thank I think you. National. Thank you, Dr. Elsen. And I, I think we first need to use the ones we have correctly. We have iron supplements. And most times we don't achieve the recommended uh, six months of iron supplements. Maybe we could have prevented the use of uh, iron sucrose. We need to look at what is the magnitude of people we need to administer iron sucrose as evidence for us to justify it included in the essential maternal newborn care guidelines. Because I don't think it's a cheap drug. If we are going to request for it, it may be slightly expensive. I may be short-sighted, but that is usually the question they ask. Where is the evidence for us used in Uganda? What amount of people are affected? But can we first use the oral supplementation? And if that fails, if we're able to give the six months iron, we could prevent a majority of these women uh, ending up being anemia. Are we able to prevent malaria, for example, using IPT? then we were able to reduce the number of women requiring that emergency iron sucrose, which we have requested for. It is the comment we would give, maybe Dr. Mugai to do. Chair, Chair briefly, briefly, I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Nonge has elaborated, talked about that, I'm sorry for delaying you, uh, but um, uh, I entirely agree with him. We have very low, uh, in the morning I had you presenting, we have very low screening levels for anemia uh, during antenatal. At uh, the country, I think we are around 26% uh, screening levels. And this is a challenge. So meaning that a mother uh, uh, gets anemia and reaches time of delivery when it's anemic. And uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Asen. Uh, uh, iron sucrose actually works, uh, works, uh, but it's very expensive. And um, we, we, we need that. I, I've seen it's being used in the private sector, but I think we need more evidence, uh, especially in, in acute cases. I know it's been uh, of great use in iron deficiency uh, of a chronic type, uh, but in acute cases, how, how good it is, we may need more evidence as, as Dr. Summers said, but also the cost is an important consideration. Uh, we, we can have more discussions outside this forum and see uh, if there is an opportunity. Thank you. Over to you, Shea. Thank you so much, Dr. Mugahi and Dr. Ononge. Uh, I hand over the microphone to Dr. Milton to wind up this. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues, for such a lively session. And we want to bring this to an end, but I'm wondering why Kamuli is asking for ketamine in obstetrics. Can't you do spinal as we go into the next uh, presentation? That is a question to doctor. So the problem is here is talk. <laughs> Okay, okay. So after the president, we shall have just two minutes for Prof. Prof. Uh, Wanda to tell, to just say something to us. I would like to thank the Assistant Commissioner, Dr. Mugahi, for I think his leadership and support, especially for ensuring that we reduce. So step number one has happened, which is the guidelines are out. And I think it's the first time we are having generally consensus across the country where there is input from almost all the regions. So I think the guidelines are valid. Now the issue is how do we monitor the implementation? And I think there should be a clear monitoring plan or, or framework. Those terms they use at the ministry to see how actually if the guidelines will improve care and also mothers die. Secondly, there were a few small things people spoke about. Do I use 14 in one liter? Do I use 20? 20 in 500. I think really we do some mathematics. Just put in a calculator. What does 14 in 1,000 mean? 
So can I get that same concentration? Because it's about the concentration of oxytocin per milliliter. And I think the 20 in 100 in 500 will give you the same as the 40 in 1,000. When does oxytocin become useless, not useless, but when is it too much to give an effect? I think the people who do the basic sciences know maybe the problem. put an IV line. So it may actually point to the fact that we are ignoring the small, small things and hitting big. Where I work, I have an IV vein finder. If I can't see, I have a vein finder. I look and I see, I put a line. I know how to put a central line. I know how to. So it may mean that some mothers actually don't die because of lack of surplus. It may be lack of access. So if you cannot put a good IV line, of course, you'll, the woman will die. So I think uh, some of those skills, regional, district, I think in the interim, where they are anesthetic officers, obstetricians, medical officers, at least learn how to put a, a jugular vein line or something like that. That may save the woman's life. But if you're coming with a pink cannula or no cannula, of course, I'll die. Thank you so much, President, for that submission. So two minutes for Prof. And after, I'll request Dr. Mugabe to give us an energizer. Yes. Thank you very much. we now have guidelines our our goal for a long time but we are glad that we have reached there and i want to thank all the members who have participated in this writing of the guidelines i know it's not an easy thing but i thank you for all the effort that you have given or you have put in in writing this guide them. It's important that we all do them times, but we usually want to go by the guidelines that they have given us. I have heard of the oxytocin. Usually, we, I always urge my students and I tell my colleagues that if you put up an IV line for oxytocin, it should be strictly for only oxytocin, not for resuscitation. Because the common mistake that we normally make that we put it for, for oxytocin and resuscitation. And therefore, the action of oxytocin is not good enough. So put up an IV line for oxytocin and another IV line for resuscitation for you to achieve good results. Dr. Milton has asked me to talk about a Cochrane review. I did a Cochrane review with the lead Professor Andrew Wicks and Kelly Francis in Liverpool comparing total abdominal hysterectomy, B. Lynch, then a bacteric balloon, compression, and hemostatic in the prevention, in the management of PPH. And one of the things that we found that, of course, TH was very effective as expected. Then a BLH was, was the one which was following. Then ligation of the blood vessels was the one which was follow, which followed as number three. The bacteric balloon, we do not see any effect on the prevent on management. Oh. 
or PPS. Yes, Oz, they are in, is it inseparable? Incomparable, somewhat, like they are two. So, uh, the internet was that we have here, system, you are welcome. Yes, 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 so I don't know about you, but um,
was cut down to the So uh, I'm going to skip some slides because that talks about the value of PPH, that talks about the statistics, that talks about the causes, but most important, we know that the biggest cause of PPH in our country is the atom and which is preventable, right? Yes. So let's go. I want to go straight to the table. Right, okay. Um, okay, so here the slide says maternal mortality due to BPH has a negative impact on women. That family is uncommunities in low middle income families. When you just look at this graph, we see that when a mother gets BPH or when a mother dies with BPH, there are four spaces. We have physical, we have psychological, we have social and economic impacts. And we know that the majority of deaths from PPH are due to which are actually that they could be prevented. But also seeing the current standard of care territory that we have requires substance, hulking transport, and storage at two effective resolutions, typically in a refrigerator to maintain its effectiveness. And this imposes a challenge in low and middle income countries where access to certain protein may not be readily available. We have been having this discussion talking about oxytocin, talking about the cold chain failure, talking about some of us who have the ice packs, but then when one people are in class, they do not replace, you know. Then some of us do have the, 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 the cold chain. Yes, we know how to maintain. But there are problems, even something when we tell our mothers to go and buy. Are we sure that the oxytocin they are going to buy has been stored very rarely? Are we sure that we are being able to maintain that whole chain? So we appreciate that the problem is there. And how do we overcome this problem? New solutions are needed to prevent the and that is why I'm discussing about the hospital. And then to see. Next slide. So what is this stable carbon dose? Number one, this stable carbon dose is a territory, right? And it does not need to be transported or stored at two eight degree Celsius, which is stable for 48 months, that is for four years. And then when it's stored below, but it will not be frozen. And then this stable carbon dose does not require refrigeration, reducing pressure and fragile cold chain transport. And refrigerated storage infrastructure, infrastructure and low middle income. Okay, so how is this stable carbon dose different from oxygen? This is something that we really need to know. Number one, I know that stable carbon dose is a new territory, right? But number one different is heat stable is a long active synthetic analog of oxygen that contrasts the interest. The number two, we are saying that of course, when we look at the WA for recommendations, we know that we usually train our recommendations from WA for independence. So, if the WA for recommendations support the use of a dangerous prevention of PDH or all other projects where exposed is comparing to other effective user recommendations. Have recommended settings where oxytocin is unavailable or its quality cannot be guaranteed. And then also heat stable is on the EML, WHO EML. And then heat stable is approved for prevention of uterine atony due to postpartum hemorrhage atony following C section and vaginal delivery under the New Swiss Medic and uh, MAGFP. HP procedure. So in the next like three slides, we're looking at the WHO recommendations. Number one, we see that the use of an effective uterotonic for the prevention of PPA during third stage for all births. But what does it say? The first recommendation is oxytocin. That is WHO. And the second recommendation is carbentosin. Then mesoprostol, egometrin, oxytocin and egometrin combination follow. Next slide. 
So this is the same thing. We are looking at the first recommendation, second recommendation, and then recommendation number three. So this slide basically shows that heat stable carbentosin is included on the EML of WHO and it comes in as an injection, which is 100 micrograms, which is equivalent to one mil, okay? 100 micrograms. know that it binds to oxytocin receptors and stimulates myometrial smooth muscle contractions. And what does carbentosin do? Carbentosin, it is the mechanism of action is the same as oxytocin, but the duration of uterine activity is longer, okay? The duration of uterine activity is longer. Okay, continue. So what is the clinical value of a heat stable carbentosin? Number one, we already said that heat stable carbentosin does not need refrigeration. You don't need cold chain, okay? And then it can be stored for up to 48 months at 30 degrees Celsius. And then heat stable carbentosin can be given as a single dose. That's why I'll emphasize something like one dose, one patient. So it is given as a single dose and easy to administer for the prevention of PPH. So if you're going to use heat stable carbentosin, you may not be required to use other uterotonics in the prevention of PPH. Okay, then the next one, uh, the safety profile of course, as per the meta-analysis, heat stable carbentosin and oxytocin have the most favorable side effect profiles. I think this one we know according, uh, when you want to compare, with the other uterotonics like um, misoprostol and then ingometrin. And those side effects that we are talking about is usually fever, nausea, shivering, and then vomiting. Okay, so in this slide, we are looking at heat stable carbentosin versus oxytocin. When we give heat stable carbentosin at the same time, under the same conditions, you realize that carbentosin well, if you give 100 micrograms IM, it will take a duration of 119 minutes. And then for oxytocin, which is given as 10 international units IM, it will take a duration of 30 minutes. Pardon? Before? Before we are in off. Okay. Yes, that's why we say that the duration of action is longer. Okay. Next slide. So heat stable carbentosin comes like this. This is the pack, which is called carbentosin fairing, and it is approved for only and only for prevention of uterine atony due to postpartum hemorrhage. But important here, heat stable carbentosin must be administered only after the delivery of the infant. I think we know why. Longer duration, okay? Next slide. So what are the contraindications? This is very important because for me, I'm presenting on correct use of heat stable carbentosin. So one of the, uh, some of the contraindications here is not used for labor induction and augmentation. Of course, we know the oxytocin that we are comparing to, you use it for induction, you use it for augmentation, but this one is only and only for prevention of PPH. Then during pregnancy and labor in women with serious cardiovascular disorders, in women with hepatic or renal disorders, women with epilepsy, and women with hypersensitivity to carbentosin, oxytocin, or any other excipients according to the composition. Okay, next slide. So what are the warnings, serious warnings about the use of heat stable? The use of heat stable carbentosin at any stage before the delivery of the infant is not appropriate because uterotonic activity persists for several hours. Another one is rule out the presence of another baby multiple gestation before administration. And then never inject heat stable carbentosin before birth of the infant. Okay. 
All right, so this is how the park still looks like. This is Carbentos in fairing. Commercial park contains 10 ampules per box, which is sufficient for 10 patients. Because I remember I said that it is one dose, one patient. So if you have your box of 10, just know it is covering for 10 mothers or patients. Continue. Then administration, of course, it must be injected as soon as possible, just like the same way we manage third stage of labor, yes? So it must be injected as soon as possible after the birth of the infant and preferably before delivery of the placenta. But also important that it must be administered by a skilled birth attendant, okay? And then make sure that this is not a multiple gestation. If another baby is present, do not, please do not inject heat stable carbentosin. okay? Then uh, administration, the solution in this ampule is for undiluted use. Whether you're going to give IV, whether it is IM, it is undiluted, okay? Now I need to bring in the oxytocin bit because we know it is the oxytocin that we are used to. The times when you're using it, you put it in the IV drip, right? But here for heat stable, it is undiluted for both IM and IV. So you, you use a two mil syringe because remember by the way we said heat stable carbentosin is one mil, isn't it? So for purposes of economy, it's better you use a two mil syringe to give you one mil, right? And then the ampule solution should not be diluted before injection. It is one dose, one patient. Okay, so there are no studies that have been carried out that if you give one, you can give another one. It is just one dose, one patient. So for IV injection, this is important. Um, heat stable carbentosin can be administered in both vaginal birth and cesarean section. Then one meal is administered slowly over one minute directly in the IV. Port. That is for IV. It is also something that is very important. So do not inject heat stable carbentosin into the intravascular fluid bag. It is supposed to be directly, slowly in the IV port. Okay. For IM, of course, this is IM. You give it one mil, which is equivalent to 100 micrograms. So uh, then for interactions, it can be administered for prevention of PPH. Even if oxytocin or any other uterotonics have been given during labor, okay? Then another thing, if bleeding occurs, it means that now we are no longer preventing, isn't it? means that we are going to go and follow our local protocols in the management of PPH. But for heat stable carbentosin, I'm really emphasizing it is only and only for prevention of PPH. Then um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, then the storage, as already said, I said that heat stable carbentosin remains stable for 48 months if stored below 30 degrees. But we say do not freeze heat stable carbentosin. The ampules must be kept in the outer carton to protect the product from light during storage. And also before giving, we usually look at the expiry date. Yeah, just like any other drug, you need to ensure that it is not an expired drug. So what is our progress with heat stable carbentosin in Uganda? And these are things that we've been discussing and I'm happy Dr. Ononge is also on. He'll give his submissions. But number one, this drug has been approved by MOH, yes? And then it, it is registered by National Drug Authority and also included in the recent uh, essential maternal and newborn care guidelines in the management of third stage of labor. You realize in the management, you have your oxytocin and you also have your carbentosin. But as you said, you compare and see. If you feel that your oxytocin you're going to use is not really potent enough, it's the book I've been is that for you. Then what are the plans? We are going to include, I think this one is underway. It's going to be included on the EML. And after being included on the EML, to also be included in the UCG, then procurement by AMCHIP, 
and then training on correct use. So we are training people here and we, are, we know that they will also go back and train people on heat stable carbentosin, okay? I know the commonest question that comes in is, when is the drug coming? Dr. Onunga will answer that. So heat stable carbentosin in summary is the WHO recommended uterotonic for the prevention of PPH and is also on WHO's EML. Then it has a longer duration of action uh, than oxytocin. It is beneficial for using PPH prevention, but histebocabentosin should be used, should not be used during pregnancy or before birth of the baby. Then histebocabentosin has most favorable side effects. It is the only injectable uterotonic that is approved for storage conditions at 30 degrees Celsius for 48 months. And then lastly, it is one dose, one patient. Thank you so much for listening. So are we having questions right now? Okay. The last slide. Thank you so much, Adija, for the wonderful presentation. My question is, okay, from the presentation, it's one patient, one dose, and we're using it for prevention and takes about two hours in action. My question is, if I progress to PPH and I don't have anything misoprost, but I have this carbetosin, can I repeat and when do I repeat? Thank you so much. Uh, that one is captured. Thank you much, Adija. So the ampule, is it 250 micrograms or it is 100 micrograms? Huh? Not, not, uh... um, I, I just, I am happy that learning has taken place the audience is answering questions by themselves. So already that one is answered, Dr. Nakendo, 100 micrograms, yes? And then sister, for yours, again, someone here will answer you, I'm sure. Learning has taken place. Yeah, I just wanted, uh, I didn't see it in one of your slides. Maybe it was there and you skipped it. But uh, we need to, to know the indications. Who should you give cabetoxin? If in your history taking or during antenatal, you grade these mothers as high risk and low risk. So if you have a mother that has had previous history of PPH, she has, if she had PPH on the first pregnancy, she has a 50% chance of getting PPH on the second pregnancy. That's one will also qualify. If you had a mother that had PPH on the previous two, she has a 75% chance of getting PPH and massive PPH on the following pregnancy. So we need to screen these mothers. I know these mothers sometimes come when they don't have the antenatal charts and you are always looking, when did the labor start? Have you bled? And you end there. But take time with these patients, take good history, and you must give the drug appropriately, as they have said. Thank you so much, Dr. Suzanne. Um, any other question? Any, any question from the online people? There's no question. But uh, I would beg Dr. Ononge say something on how far we are with the EML. Dr. Ononge, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dija, for ably presenting heat stable carbetosin, updating the members. And uh, I thank you for taking the courage. You know, I challenge the Dija that you need to, we need to work together, OBGYN and, and midwives. And she was initially scared and said, how will I make presentation to OBGYN? But over several meetings, she has ably done it. Thank you. Thank you much, Adija. I need to give her a hand clap. Now, the, the heat stable carbetosin is a new molecule which we believe uh, will really make a difference in situations where we are not sure of uh, 
oxytocin quality. And the, it is 100 micrograms, as Shadija put it. We need to differentiate it from carboprost. Carboprost is a prostaglandin, which is used for treatment of PP. This is 250 micrograms. I, I believe that's why Dr. Nakendo asked, is it 100 micrograms? Or is it 125 or 250? You need to depression between the two, carboprost and heat stable carbetosate. The EML is being reviewed now, and the target for Minister of Health is having it completed by end of July. And the, it he will be available, and we have got support from the Reproductive Health Division, basically to have it included and the transdermic acid on board. Now, should we screen some women to give it stable carbetosin and others no? Uh, others no? Yes, if you have the contraindications at uh, uh, Adija's presented, yes, you don't give it. However, all women who, who are pregnant are at risk of having PPH. So you shouldn't exclude, you shouldn't only say, let me keep this uh, category of women for heat stable carbetosin because of it is advantages. We say if it is available in your facility, give it so long as it is, you are using it for prevention, prevention of PPH. Whether she is, uh, we know usually we teach uh, if you have twins, you are at risk. If you have had bleeding before, you are at risk. Can we keep those ones alone for his stable carbidosis? He says no. Anyone, because we have had surprises of a prime gravida who ends up with a severe PPH when you didn't even prepare. So all women are at risk of PPH, just like uh, in the morning presentation, we need basically to to ensure that we do active management third stage of labor. So if you have a oxytocin or, or mysoprostol or it's stable capitocin, you give them. There is no need for you to identify only those at high risk and give them alone. Uh, a question which keeps on coming, are we going to phase out oxytocin? No, oxytocin has more uses. We use it for induction. We use it for post-abortion care. It is not yet for heat stable carbetosin. Uh, we also use it for treatment of PPH. So oxytocin is still our drug of choice for treatment. So in, in a woman who you give heat stable carbetosin and she ends up bleeding, you now move to the treatment, which is Oxytocin first, then you give other drugs as uh, Dr. Uh, Milton actually presented in the morning. So there is no repeating. You repeat when you start repeating. That means you are now treating and you are you are violating the guidelines. That you, you can't use its tabocarbetosin for for treatment. I don't know whether there is another question for me. When is it coming? Well, let's pray that the money from AMCHIP would be available to us. And Dr. Morokora had hinted that maybe they could get some money and procure some and pilot it in few areas which have a, a, a really high burden of what of CPH. Over to you, Adija. I don't know if they want to add something. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nongi. I've taken over from Hadija. And thank you, Hadija, for the presentation. I think if we don't have any other questions, then uh, we can get the closing remarks from the president. Thereafter, we shall have lunch. And uh, we shall leave, but we shall have to pass uh, Angela's corner. Angela is uh, our secretary at AOGU. And the all midwives should be associate members. Pardon? Hey, we shall have a group, a group photo before that. But uh, midwives are welcome to join our association as associate members. The number of uh, contributing to creating them. So come join us. We make a good, a bigger group so that we can uh, 
have a bigger and a more vibrant association. Even in doctors, yes. Yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> then I should join. <laughs> no. Eh. We shall discuss after this. So, Dr. Musana, you're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Bameka and Chairperson, for this session or for this dissemination. I, I am Othiniel Musana, an obstetrician gynecologist by training. I'm also a super specialist and uh, I did gyno oncology. I practice in the private sector. I am the current president of AOGU, and AOGU is the Association of Social and Gynecologists of Uganda. It's been in existence for 37 years now. And as we move forward, there's been an evolution of AOGU, but also of the health sector in Uganda. A lot of, a lot of in 1985, when the AOG was founded, there was one university and one training institution, that was Makere Mulago. As I speak now, there are about six postgrad medical schools, and I think about three more are coming into the equation. Uh, every year we graduate about 50 new obstetricians and gynecologists from these six institutions. Mulago and Imbarara still have the bulk of the, still have the bulk of uh, all of those obstetricians. I know Busitam, I think, wants to start. Uh, so what is a, an association? What we call a, an association is made up of members who serve in the same industry. Now, OBS and GYN as members or as a profession, we're supposed to congregate in an association. And of course, uh, most of our work is around offering conferences and continuing medical education but also in some capacities we serve as trade unions. So where two or three are gathered, you can have industry action and it is legal. AOGU, I'm not encouraging it, but AOGU took part in encouraging members to do industry action. And I'm hoping that uh, by the end of the month or by the end of the financial year, those of you who work in the government will be happier so that you can serve. Then you can put the gun and hold you accountable. So. Why should we belong to associations, to professional associations? One is that many of us are linked to job opportunities, their benefits. We are linked to networks. Some of us have networks we've never known who should exist. For example, the commissioner knows many of you here. So in case of chances on your application, it will be a network which is worth it. Uh, we need to stay up to date with industry news. Now, some of us, the center at LG is pushing things to the periphery. This is news, by the way. But also, Dr. Mugabe has not happening in Kampala. What is new? Can I move? Can I, all those things are important. It helps you to stand out to potential employers. These days, if you go to the Health Service Commission, they normally want to know, what do your colleagues think about you? And if your colleagues have a bad report about you, trust me, things may go bad. But also, we want to develop as professionals through CPD and become experts. But of course, advocacy, a key role that I'm playing here, the job of the president is not that you're the best clinician. It is about advocacy and opening doors and knocking on doors to make sure that your members are supported wherever they are. And of course, sharing information. So the founding members, those were the founding members in 1985. I think a few may not be here with us, but there are some who are still alive. And at that time when they founded LGU, many of them are just sharing information. But as I've said, over the years things have changed. Now, between 2011 and 2014, our role is to consolidate LGU in reducing maternal or preventable maternal deaths. But also we want a member who is solid what an obstetrician who is a non nationally. So our vision is we want the obstetricians to be leaders in that arena, whether it's in academia, whether it is in politics, 
whether it is in a clinical practice, research, we want to be leaders and define the agenda. Those of you who came for the last conference, part of what we are doing now is driving an agenda. And I'm hoping that in the next few years that agenda will be strengthened. And our mission, the members are in those five red areas. They are members who are just stuck in clinical practice and they should excel in clinical practice. That's why we advocate for them to get paid because they are delivering on that aspect. There are some of our members who are in education. And by the congratulations, Dr. Milton, the professors and the rest, and they should excel in education. There are members who are in research, the members who are serving in CS and other things, and we're linking them through collaborations. And of course, there are people like us who are not focused on advocacy, 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 not advocacy only for our members, but also advocacy for the public. If we find you're doing something wrong, we shall make some noise, whether you are a member also, to protect the public good. So what are our objectives strategically? One is we want competent members available in the entire region. So we want people who are committed. And I think many of the members here are showing their commitment. Even by just coming here, it shows that there is a commitment to actually, and it means most of those members are motivated and they're competent. So we also want to expand opportunities. If I come and know Dr. Mugabe does this, Hadija does this, I want to expand your opportunities or we need to expand your opportunities. And of course, I kept talking about monitoring and evaluation. We want to know that when things happen, what is the impact of our members doing their work? That is something we need to capture. But also, as time moves on, there are some of you who may never have been promoted and the rest. I think AOG, you can design a mechanism where we can accredit our members based on their body of work. So there may be a medical officer somewhere, but for us, you are the level of a senior consultant. So your colleagues can call you senior consultant, something like that. I'm just giving an example. But also remember that we have had members specializing. We want to promote provision of quality, sexual, reproductive, and health rights. And of course, we do this with the implementing partners. And part of our work, as you've seen through NASMIC, our members are leading development, review, and disseminating of guidelines. And I'm glad that many of the people in this room have taken place. I don't sit on NASMIC, but I, I, I listen in. I'm not the expert on PPH, but I'm, I'm focused on making sure that things happen. So many of our members are leading review of standards and guidelines, but also we want LG to be a strong and vibrant association. And of course, good and effective leaders. So many of so when I come to the here, I'm looking for who can lead, who can lead, so that we groom. I know, I know in Mali there is some leadership, so people have been groomed. So can they come and then serve the association? If they can't come centrally, can they lead the regionally? And uh, that's where AOG is going. But also for our secretariat, people who work for us at AOG, we want them to be really motivated. So. We have priorities as AOGU, and this is a forum. When I say AOGU, it's not only about obstetricians, because midwives, medical officers, are also associate members. So part of our priority is making sure that we increase access to specialized services. So if I am a gynecologist, why aren't there nurses trained in oncology? Why should there be general nurses? It means I cannot work. So as I advocate for myself, I must make sure the midwives can do the pap smears. They can do so many other things to ensure that access is improved. Of course, we want to improve the quality of existing services and also the quality of our human resource. Human resource is important to us because our members are the resource we have to use. So what are our priorities in the next few years? The first one is developing evidence-based safety bundles. And what we are presenting here is evidence-based safety bundles. So our members should lead in those areas. And of course, obstetric hypertensive disorders where I'm barely led and is actually I think should become the center of excellence for PET and other things because we now know it is in Bali. And that's where the news was made. 
So all those things should become clear all the way down to C-section care bank. People are speaking about cannulas and C-section things, all those, including the thing we don't like to talk about down at number seven. The number two, as part of improving uh, access to obstetric services. Now, you may find in a district there are obstetricians, but professionals don't have access. You may find there is a colleague in a district, but even the MOs cannot consult access. You may find there is an O and G in a district, but even there has no access. So improving access is not just to the patient and the community, even to colleagues. I can say, please let me refer you to Dr. Ankarovo, access. So we want to, so we developed, sorry, we constituted the ethics and small committee at LGU. And this one is a committee that is actually supposed to drive us professionally by de developing our practice, that is training, research, accreditation, basically st setting standards for all of us as ONGs in the country. It is led by Professor Okong, three past presidents, that's Dr. Yaruhanga, Dr. Waswasa Rongo from Ambarara, and uh, Dr. Sister Priscilla, who is the immediate past president. And then ex-officials, -official, ex officials, people who sit there because of recommendation, and one of them is here. She's smiling under the mask, Dr. Chizara. These are people of integrity, people we know are committed. I don't sit on that committee because I may also put in my own things. So we want people who are unbiased and we can trust them. Now, in line with this, we are negotiating, not we are, we are negotiating with the Medical Council. Medical Council is going to delegate some of its powers to AOG to make sure that all O and Gs, even midwives, fall in line with the professionalism. For example, I'm an O and G. I'm a gyno oncologist, but you find me doing CPD of stroke, diabetic foot, uh, fracture femur, then I go back for licensure. That is not right. So AOG will be responsible for accrediting your CPD before you get licensed. To make sure that if Dr. Our, if Dr. Milton is an obstetrician and gynecologist, the CPD, at least 70% of their CPD is in the area of specialization. That's how we shall come in to regulate. But of course, even now, the council has agreed to send all cases of discipline, whether by midwives or MOs or obstetricians through AOGU, as long as they touch obstetric practice. So this committee will be very important. But of course, part of it is advocating for welfare. Welfare. Our members, including the midwives, must, they must be healthy, happy, and they're thriving. They should not be hungry and so we want members who are and welfare i think we put our foot down at some point early this around the uh, april april this year we want to, our members are by profiling them so who is this dr mugabe we're talking about what can he do what is he skilled in how can we promote him so that he's able to deliver and also thrive so we want to profile those members. Who are these senior consultants and professors? What are they actually able to do? So that we promote them. We are promoting super specialization. We don't believe that we are the same 30 years ago. So things have changed. So when you're talking about regional referral hospital, referring to do Caesar, referring to give blood, it should be referral for a particular skill that the others do not have. And of course, part of what the council wants us to do is to produce a scope of practice because things have changed. In 19, I think 85, there may have been about 35 ONGs in the country. Now they think they're almost 500 plus. There may have been a few midwives now. So should things remain the same, even in presence of specialization or not? The other one is quality. And of course, we want to build and strengthen partnerships with universities and all other bodies, CSOs, promoting research. AOG is going to set up a research agenda at national level. Because for example, why is PPH still killing people? But people have been trained, people have been, so what is the agenda moving forward to help resolve those issues? And AOG has been very keen in 
training people in grant writing. I think some people here in, in this room are beneficiaries of that. Grant writing and a few other things. And of course, advocacy, advocacy. Uh, not all of us are good clinicians. Some of us are good at talking. Not all of us are good teachers, but some may be good clinicians. Let everybody thrive and let us advocate for, first of all, if you're being attacked by people, how can we defend you? We are now, LG now has a collaboration with some legal bodies that in case our members, our members are attacked, we sometimes come in and chip in for you. Okay. Of course, we need to market our members and other things that come on next presentation. I hope I, hope I don't bring questions. I'm just giving information of what is happening so that members are updated. So don't ask me now how are you advocating. Sometimes you'll hear, sometimes you will. Yeah. Yes, please. Actually, the biggest beneficiaries of our, our activities are the associate members. Not so, Angela. If we get one billion shillings, about 700 million is taken by the associate members, because they, they actually are at the bulk of the professionals. They reach their mother down there. So from skiing to advocacy, we talk about our associate members. So the obstetrician gynecologist as a professional, we should not forget we are professionals. So we are bound by certain codes. So we are bound by certain codes. Now, this is something that uh, many of our members, I I'm not sure if they have forgotten, they don't understand their role to the profession, their role to the community, their role to the employer, and their role to the nation. So a professional belongs to a profession. So for us, you must have a qualification. So if you have an equivalent of an MMED, OBSGYN, we say you're an obstetrician gynecologist. And of course, that qualification makes, means you have to conform to particular technical standards and other codes of conduct. So, and these are normally set by federal professional bodies that psychiatrists smile like this. So professionalism is conduct, aims, and qualities that mark our, so our behavior and attitude in the workplace. We don't want to be hearing, oh, and Jesus is an akowa. So when you hear Dr. Susan is saying, get, I mean, get. attitude and behavior is governed because you are a professional. And the, some of the, and the people who are supposed to safeguard this, some of them are in this room, like the team from Bali there. If you're a senior consultant, you're a professor, you then suppose you become the safeguard for these things. So I'm glad to welcome some of our members who have been professionalized. They have finished their MMED like Dr. Bameka here. So they have finished their MMED. Now they can qualify to become professionals. They've been associates, yes. Uh, the conduct is how we interact with patients, colleagues, institutions, community, and society. So as a professional, you have all these roles. Of course, some of us are motivated by money and other things, but we must have a reason for why we are motivated. And it is your colleagues to actually pick and say, ah, this guy or this, this lady, no. And of course, when we are talking people in Jinja or Mbale, the culture is different from Fort Porto. So if you come and say, because me, I'm from Fort Porto, this is how, no, the culture in Mbale is different. So you must work in a culturally diverse environment to deliver on some of those things. Now, as professionals, we have responsibilities. One is you must meet a minimum standard of skill and knowledge. That's normally at AOM med level. Of course, there is honesty, confidentiality, but there is a commitment to scientific knowledge. You cannot say I trained 40 years ago, 10 years ago, and then you were stuck there. So there must be a will to update yourself in your area of specialization. And we only call you a specialist if at least you commit 80% of your time to that discipline. Okay. And then, of course, there are responsibilities like 
licensure. That's why we, we get a license every year. And of course, there is subscription personal bodies. So what is an attribute? What are the attributes of an obstetrician and gynecologist? When I'm talking, I'm talking also to the, the nurses. I'm not very I'm not very clear with your ranks. I know there is ANO, nursing officer, SPNO, PNO. They also have their ranks as our associates, assistant senior nursing. So an obstetrician has to have specialized knowledge. That is either through skill, degrees, certificates, and other things. They must be competent. You must be competent in what you do. Now, as regards PPH, we must be accountable, really. Why are women dying? The commission has spoke about organized what? absenteeism. I support him, but also sometimes disagree. Because in my head, as an advocate, the law says you should work for 48 hours. But if you have a burnt out obstetrician, they may do more harm than good. This thing of working, you, I don't know, one 40 hours a week if it is possible. You work, you work, you crawl, see, 48 hours is enough. The remaining time can be offered to other people to re so recruit more people. Of course, self-regulation, we must be regulated by our colleagues and by personal things. And of course, we must look at the part. An obstetrician and gynecology must look like a must look like Dr. Susan. This looks money, driving a good car. So our colleagues, we must advocate that we must look the part. So when you enter a room and they say, Dr. Wandabo, we should just see, we should just ooze. That's why many of us chose to become obstetricians, gynecologists, because we saw some people who looked the part. So as I've told you, most of our work in PPH is around the clinician, the person actually seeing the PPH patients. And these guidelines are built mainly for the clinician. However, for the clinician to perform their work, we have those people up there, administrators. They must support the clinician. And as far as I am concerned, as a professional, the clinician is the most important person in this equation, this one. For us to reduce deaths, that person must be available. Of course, the academics will support with data and other things. The policy makers, the policy has come out, enabling a policy. The researchers will help, but that clinician at the core must be paid well, they must be well rested, they must be skilled, they must be. So all of us are in support of that person. Sometimes a person may be playing multiple roles, the clinician, and but know that the rest of us are actually in support. So I normally like this slide because it makes me want to work more. Do we want experts or do we want experienced people? In some definitions, the expert is somebody who has intense experience through practice, practice and education in a particular field. And they must be the reliable source of technique. I may be the consultant, but I'm not the reliable source of the technique and the skill. And I must accept, like I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert in PPH. I don't, I see few patients of PPH. So Dr. Susan may know better, though I may be her senior. So she's the expert there. Is, are you reliable? And an expert does the same thing the right way every time. Now, for us who are experienced, I'm, no, I'm, I'm an experienced obstetrician, but do I see obstetric patients? But because of years of experience, most of us, ah, we've been exposed to PPH, and sometimes you're doing the, the wrong thing, but you're becoming more confident. When I bathe the woman, she'll stop bleeding. And I bathe the women, I bathe the women. So when you come back for MMA, you're trying to remove experience to make you an expert in your field of area. And of, sometimes the experience just comes unintentionally. You're the one who is there anyway. Now I want to come to the job roles. And this is where, as an advocate, AOGU and myself as the president are heavily involved. Wherever we go, we are advocating. When you go to 
offices we are advocating in that area. So we have the clinical side and the academia side, because we know most of our members are in those two areas, whether in public service or in private sector. Now, one of the things that is strange to me and needs a lot of advocacy is the structure at Regional Referral Hospital. Because we are obstetricians and gynecologists. And that level of facility is supposed to be a referral. So what are you referring to, referring for? So if it is obstetrics, you're referring women who have maternal fetal medicine conditions. You're not referring there for cesarean section. There must be something worth referring. And we must have an obstetrician who is dealing with MFM. You must have one dealing with general obstetrics. Then, of course, there is gynecology. So already we have occupied two positions. You must have one dealing with oncology, urogyne. I think anybody does some urogyne somewhere. Yeah. There must be some urogyne. There must be somebody doing general gynecology. And there must be somebody doing reproductive medicine. So the minimum number at that level, one, two, three, four, five, six, should be six obstetricians, minimum. Because Caesar is still, it's not everyone can do Caesar. But there's, why am I referring to Dr. Mugabe at Imbali to give blood? No, we can give blood at center four. Then we have our bosses there the senior consultants, in terms of supervision, who supervises who? And when we mention a senior consultant, what is the structure under to support that senior consultant? Yeah, the General Referral Hospital is built for the senior consultant and they must be supported. So how are they supported? Of course, the senior consultant will supervise two consultants. So if you have MFM, there should be a senior consultant and two consultants and four special grade because each consultant also supervise two special grade. I have removed the MO because in my belief, those should go a little lower in the level of care, but that level, so a senior consultant should supervise two consultants. Those two should supervise two each. So the minimum number should be one, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven, seven specialists. If you have a senior consultant, they should supervise literally six specialists. And the, the jobs are there for some reason not occupied. Now, why is this office very important? It is the first time I'm using office, the office of, and when you're advocating, those are the, those are the people who should be driving them, paying on those big cars. They should have a driver. Sometimes they should even have a lead car, I think. Eh? They should have, yes, those guys, eh? those guys. So when I go to a place, I first look for that guy. And I first look and see, does he have a government car, does he? And I'll tell you why they need to have those things. They are the ones supposed to assure us. For us Christians, we've seen blessed assurance. We are assured that we shall go to heaven. Assured, not insured, assured. So if this guy does their work, we are assured things will settle in the health sector. But you must provide for them. If I find a senior consultant doing more scissors than Susan, we should bring them backwards and take them to special grade. Because their work is not manual. It is strategy, policy, training needs assessment, major world rounds. They're the ones who lead clinical meetings. They're the ones who do the grand rounds. So if Dr. Bameka is very active in organizing grand rounds, we don't say Dr. Bameka did a good job. We say Professor Wanda did a good job because it is their work. But Bameka has to learn how to do grand rounds because it may also get there. Technical meetings, and I'm, and I'm glad that many members at that level are attending the technical meetings. Support supervision and mentorship. Sort of their work has a report plan, report plan, report plan. That's why it's an office. Quality improvement, performance management. SOPs are 
the benefit of the senior consultant. So even if I write the SOP, it must be signed by my senior consultant. The ones who have the competence to know it's actually a good SOP or not. That's why it's an office and they must get their due. So when you're advocating, you're saying pay those guys the 20 and also put a car and also put a driver. They should not drive themselves. They should not work call duties because they have to think they should not do our manual work here. I'll show you who the manual work people are. The same thing with the midwives, when you get certain level, if you're thinking about pushing, that's why you'll find in other BFRs cause problems. People are supposed to be doing strategy in midwifery. They also want to deliver. So no one does the strategy and things fail. Then of course, there is the supervisor. The senior consultant doesn't, the senior consultant serves the nation. So there is no way DHO can refuse a senior consultant to end the facility who shall arrest you because he serves a nation. If it's, I don't know what this highest rank in midwifery is, PNO. Okay, I don't know, but that level, if they, they are allowed to enter any facility and actually assess it because they serve the nation, they're not district people. Sometimes we have problems with the, the district and the regional referral hospital. It's in their mandate. Then of course we have the supervisor who is the consultant obstetrician. These things are competence-based. The, super, the consultant supervises the provision of, so it means under them, there is a provider. Hmm? One is assuring, assure us, supervise us. Eh? So for them, they normally serve the region and the facility. So a consultant can enter any facility in the region as long as it's under their jurisdiction and they can perform duties there and supervise. They do odd rounds, they have CPDs, they do trainings, they run the clinics. They're the ones responsible for supervision of the facility and they are also entitled to do support supervision. So supervising means you observe a person and direct them on what to do. It means you can do and you have the competence of directing them on what to do. So. Then we have, for the obstetrician, we have the lowest level. For us, who do the donkey work? Who carry the load? Eh? Because we are still learning how to do, 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 do. Hmm? We are the ones who provide, I'm underlining the keywords. And for us, we work at the facility level, unless there is no consultant. So we are the ones who do, cut all the scissors, cut all the hysterectomies. The, the consultant then says, but you're doing it the wrong way. It's supposed to be done like this. Then the other guy is like, for us to reduce deaths from this, this is the way we have to go. So for us, our work is a lot of manual work. Just like you say, enrolled midwives, nursing officers, supposed to slash the grass, but somebody must have overseen. Then of course, there are people who are sometimes appointed to manage facilities. And we have members who are there and their work is to make sure that the rest of us do our work. Ensure means make sure. So the higher you go in the hierarchy, the more meetings you attend. So when I find obstetrician is saying, but Dr. Wandaba is always in meetings, that is his work. Your work is to slash the ground. Hey, Dr. Susan is the one who goes to support supervision. That is their work. For you, your work is to slash the compound and let them do the support supervision. But you must learn how she supervises because if you want to get there, you must understand what makes her get there. I don't know if I'm making sense. So I don't want to hear complaints of saying, Dr. Bameka came, he found me here, then he was promoted to consultant. It's because they developed the competences of a consultant. It's not about how long you've been there and how many years you have served. It's about, do you have the competences. Now he has gone and become, I think, what? A PhD. Automatically, his competences are more than mine in that area. 
So if they promote him, I cannot be seen. But I came here before Milton. Then I did it. Then it was my junior in medical school. No, the competences uh, have moved. So he deserves the position. So when we are going to the Health Service Commission and we find colleagues, but I've been in Morago for 30 years. You've not developed the competences required for this position. But so and so has them. So I will end there on that one. And I will just go into my last presentation. So this was information for obstetricians. So when you're developing a scope of practice and we're saying what are our senior consultants supposed to do? They're supposed to assure us that things will be okay. So now this protocol and other things are the outputs of the senior consultants. But many of us took part it means we are learning what they do. But in case a chance comes for us to grow, I can say, by the way, I was learning under Dr. Milton to do how to develop a guideline, how to monitor. Yeah. Yes. So please don't ask me questions. I'm just giving information. But you can take it or leave it. So as AOGU, why are women dying? Why do women still die? Why do women still die? We have many teachers here. And uh, for us, we are calling the case for proper resuscitation. Our women should not die. They should be resuscitated. That's why they, I think they kind of really struck me at Kawan. That a small thing may save your life. So, simple questions. How much blood does the uterus accrue? How much blood flows through the uterus in a nine months pregnancy? These are simple things, by the way. It is about 700 meals on average. In one minute, 700 meals goes through the uterus in one minute at term. So it means if you're bleeding and the blood is not stopped and it's uncontrolled bleeding, you're bleeding at 700 mils every minute. So if you have five liters, in about six minutes, you'll have nothing left. That's why these PPH guidelines become very, very important. Now it is the role of the senior consultant, the consultant to make them as simple as possible for us to understand how to use them. So how long will I take to lose 25, 50% or even 100% of my blood volume? Many of our mothers die while talking and they're not bleeding. It means everything is finished. Okay. So how can we accurately estimate blood loss? I don't think there's an, I think Dr. Amton spoke about it. None of us will estimate blood loss well. But there must be something each of us can do that can tell us the estimated blood loss. And the most common thing we use is blood pressure and pulse eh? to tell us that I think this woman is in shock because we can measure shock. Then there is that tool of thread. Do our midwives, do our doctors understand that you may die of because of a cannula? When I'm listening to Nazmik, I, I, I normally want to ask, but what cannula was on? But I'm like, keep, keep your peace. You may not finish the argument. Was it a pink one? Was it a blue one? Was it? And what do these things mean? What do these things mean? That is my teaching point. The uterus and bleeding is like a bathtub. Hmm? And somebody's bleeding. Okay. So when you're replacing fluids, are you replacing little or are you replacing through the large bore? Now, if somebody is bleeding 700 mils a minute, hmm, and for you, you have uh, decided to go for, let me even start with the pink. The pink delivers 60 mils of fluids a minute when it is fully opened. Eh? You understand? So in one minute, what will be the deficit I have created? 
it will be 700 minus 60. So I have a deficit of 640 mils of blood to replace. In two minutes, what will be my deficit? That is 1,000, almost 500. In 30 minutes, I'm just replacing 60, but I'm losing 700. So with each passing minute, the deficit becomes bigger. So you may be thinking you're resuscitating, but not adequately. So you must understand the tool. When they say, put too large bore, at this, as you put a too large bore, stop the bleeding, at least compress, is to prevent the leakage. At the same time, you reducing the deficit. Women don't die because bleeding has stopped. They die because of the deficit. So if you never replace the deficit or correct it in the earliest point of time, uh, women will still die. So as we are doing those guidelines, let's make them actionable. Because somebody reading an algorithm may become very difficult, but they should say that I must compress immediately. I must replace as soon as possible. So what guides, what guides the doctor to, to then move on? There's a question I keep asking. We've had this argument in Insambia. Senior colleagues, new ones come. Go. When do I say my first line has failed? Because they gave us the first line. I give my arm still, things refuse. Hmm? I begin treating PPH. Yeah. So I begin treating PPH. After years of arguing, we said, let us become objective. Dr. Mugabe is the one who is always doing hysterectomies, but patients are stable. Most of our patients are dying because you're delaying. So when do you say you have delayed? I mean, I've worked 30 years, I've worked 20, I've done, I'm good at cutting, I'm good at... So, we became objective once we began using the blood pressure. All of us can do a blood pressure. All of us. But not all of us can do a bead inch. But at least we can do a blood pressure. Even the nurse can do a blood pressure. And things are bad. So if somebody has mild shock, when we define our PPH there, the blood pressure is normally normal. There's no change usually. But they may still have things like palpitations, means they have compensated. The deficit is not so big to cause them too much problems. So, but once they begin crossing the red area, the red area we normally define it as mild shock, red to shock, the volume is around there, but we cannot measure it. What we can measure is, the blood pressure. So once the blood pressure would hit 100 systolic, we are moving you to theater. Remember, you're in a setting where there is no blood or the blood products are limited. So uh, once you hit 100, theater has, has been called, we are moving you there. We are going to our second line treatment and you are allowed to open and put a bead inch so you don't reach the other area, which is the moderate, where the blood pressure is now below 80. This is systolic. So this was a more objective way for us to decide second line treatments. Of course, it has its problems because some of us are trigger happy and we want to keep cutting, but at least it was a more objective assessment of when to proceed. So if you cross this area and you come to this level here and you're struggling with your blood pressure, there is no expert there things will go either way. So prevent yourself from reaching there. Be available, monitor the patient. I think we spoke about monitoring. Don't monitor until they die. No, monitor with the target in mind. So as AOGU, <coughs> we're encouraging our members and associate members to join. As I've told you, the biggest chunk of our budget is for associate members from BMONG to wherever they are. Three, we want competent members Four, we are hoping that by the end of the year, our bosses here on the committee of development may have come up with some guidelines on how we regulate obstetric practice, including scope of practice. As I've told you, I'm a gyno oncologist. I see 
about four pregnant women a month. And that is if they are forced to me, really. So I have no business dealing with diabetes and pregnancy. I don't see them. I'm not the expert there. But I know somebody next door does. So I say, okay, you go see Dr. Susan. Leave me alone. But we have the same qualification. The senior consultants are not consultants. For them, they should have offices. So if I go to a university hospital and I don't find an office for the senior consultant, the first place I stop is the director's office. I'm like, boss, what is wrong with you? Your job is to support this guy. So how come he has no office? How come he has not called a single meeting? How come he has not written a, a, a report for training? How come he has no transport? How come he has no fuel budget? How come? That's how I assess them. Because this is international standards at that level in public sector. So when they, even they retire, the package should be good because they have served. The consultants must supervise and they also must have a budget for support, supervision. So the first stop of an IP should not even be the director. It should be the senior consultant who then says, please, you go and supervise. The budget is there because they are the ones who are supposed to assure us that even the consultant is going to do good work, we are going to supervise. If there is no consultant, sometimes the special grade can take over. They can be trained to take over until the rank comes in. So as AOGU, we are hoping we can move in the right direction. We want to strengthen our regional chapters. Wherever we hear there's a senior consultant, we want to begin knocking on those doors and we want to make sure that our guidelines our guidelines are at the table of the senior consultant and they can be implemented so part of the output and the monitoring and that is at the level of the senior consultant if there's no senior consultant then we look for the consultant and we begin training you to get to there so i'd like to congratulate people in the east especially in Bali, you've become the preeclampsia hub. So I hope that can throw you, that limelight can shine brighter in preeclampsia. Dr. Mugabe led the walks and I saw the pictures and I was like, okay, okay, he's putting himself under fire, that's okay. So we shall bring more fire. So Bali, I hope you can be the hub. I'd like to thank Dr. Bameka, Dr. Susan and the team in the East this way, which is representing LGU. As we said, part of our role is to push things to the regions, and I hope we will succeed in that. So I'd like to declare the meeting closed. Yeah, thank you. Ah, there is a group photo, then lunch. And then uh, Angela, please inform us about the logistics. Logistics.